14th, Happy New Year, uh, Portland Planning and Sustainability Commission. On the agenda today, we have items of interest from commissioners, the director's report, uh, consent agenda has consideration of the minutes from December 17th meeting. Then we will have a uh, vote for the 2020 officers of the Planning Commission. That will be followed by the River District Master Street Plan update. This, that is a hearing and a recommendation. That will be followed by expanding opportunities for affordable housing briefing. That will be followed by a briefing on Montgomery Park to Hollywood Transit and Land Use Development Study. And then we will meet on DOZA, which is a work session, looking to adjourn at 3.30. Are there items of interest? Mike. Yes. Um, I sent a note out to PSC members and staff um, that we, uh, we have an <clears throat> upcoming um, briefing and work session and, and eventually hearing on South Reach, which is the area of the river from South Waterfront south to near where you live, um, Elk Rock Island. <clears throat> and I got to thinking that folks may not really be that familiar with a lot of the resources out there. And so I, I proposed, well, I've offered to lead bicycle boat. I'm on a 25 foot little wooden, I guess you would call it scow or, or shanty boat <clears throat> and uh, walking tours for folks who wanna go out and just get more familiar um, with the South Reach so that when we have conversations, people will have clearly in their mind, their mind's eye, um, kind of what's, what, what's out there on the ground. So um, I uh, suggested a number of dates. I'm happy to take a person out or several, obviously less than a quorum um, from the PSC and staff as well. I know Sally Edmonds contacted me already. So I'll just give you a heads up. I don't know if you all got got that, but I sent it um, sent in an email to you all. Thanks for doing that. That's a treat. It's appreciated. Any other items of interest? No. Okay, next item on the agenda is the director's report. Good afternoon. Happy 2020. It's nice to see everyone in the new year. A uh, couple of quick items to report. One is the City Council passed the tree code resolution last week um, directing uh, BPS to uh, update the economic opportunity analysis to look at impacts on industrial and commercial lands. So we are doing that work. Um, that will be, uh, we will be bringing that for a briefing for the PSC probably in May and hearings later in the fall. And then uh, next Tomorrow and Thursday, we have uh, we'll kick off the residential infill he public hearings. Uh, being at council Wednesday afternoon, Thursday evening, five to seven p.m., and um, uh, an opportunity to hear from the public, and then we'll uh, be back to council at the end of January, um, uh, January 29th, for further conversations around residential infill. So we'll keep the commission posted on that. And I wanted to give an update on our the uh, adjustment made in our residential garbage and recycling um, rates. So as you may recall, last um, spring when we were doing our annual residential rate review, we weren't quite um, sure how the um, clean energy surcharge for PCEF would affect uh, residential garbage and recycling rates. Um, we followed the administrative rules developed by the revenue division that included garbage and recycling collection as an industry subject to the surcharge. We added 17 cents per month into the rates for costs associated with the clean energy surcharge. In December, City Council voted to make um, some adjustments and modifications to that, exempting residential garbage and recycling collection from the clean energy surcharge. So last week, Council adopted new rates to reflect this change. and. Um, uh, New rates will be in place from February until June, uh, and we are um, and adjustments, rate adjustments are being made. So I wanted just to let uh, the commission know about that um, uh, change in that process and our um, modifying rates. So uh, garbage uh, garbage customers will see that adjustment made in their bill. And. Um, because we have the election today, I wanted to take a moment to thank Kat for her leadership on um, the uh, as commission chair and really have been very grateful to work with you in my short time here in this position so far and have been really impressed by the role that you've played um, 
all of you as public servants contribute so much and uh, the chair um, plays a particular role and, and contributes quite a bit um, and is often the person representing the commission in front of council and you've just done a superb job. So I just wanted to take a moment to appreciate you and thank you for your leadership. Thank you. That um, it's It's been an honor and you guys are an amazing group to work with. I've said it from the day I joined the commission. Well, maybe not the day I joined the commission. Once I kind of got to understand what the commission was all about and got to know all you better, um, I've just felt so fortunate to be a part of this group. And so I appreciate you guys all bearing with me. I've had my mistakes and fumbling moments and done my best. And you guys have been a good group to, to work with. So thank you. Yes, Jeff. Uh, well, I was going to save my con glad congratulatory remarks or after we actually vote, but uh, thank you. But I want to go back to one thing in, in the director's report about RIP. And can we get just sort of an update of what's being proposed? I've read a couple of articles where council members are suggesting various amendments. Is, is there, are they sort of on the table for the hearing tomorrow or just sort of what's going on with the proposals? Absol absolutely. No, what we're, um, what's being considered is what the PSC has recommended to the um, city council. Uh, the hearing over the next two days will be an opportunity to gather more amendments. We will bring the first package of amendments um, to the January 29th um, council session. And from the hearing over the next two days, there may, may be additional amendments, in which case we will bring those, that package of amendments in um, early February. Okay. And can, can we get copies of what you're, am I on, of, of what staff is preparing for council, just so we can kind of be on top of what's, what's up? Our PowerPoint? Yeah. Or is, oh, it'll be a PowerPoint. It will be written amendments. We, um, you can, we're happy to share that when we bring that to council on the 29th. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. Happy to do that. Great. Any, um, I guess, next uh, item on the agenda is the consent agenda. So consideration of the minutes from December 17th meeting. Do I have a motion? Move adoption. Second. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? No opposed. So that passes. We're just moving it along. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next item is um, our vote for the 2020 officers. Do we have anybody who wants to make a motion on a slate? Madam Chair. Uh, first, I want to say it, it's been my honor to serve as your vice chair for the last four years, and I appreciate the commission allowing me to do that. And uh, During that whole term, I've been partnered with Kat as our chair, and I want to add my thanks to her excellent job chairing the commission for four years. So I would like to move a slate consisting of uh, Eli Spivak for uh, chair. Uh, for vice chairs, Kat Schultz, to continue in the leadership of the commission, uh, and Steph Routh. Um, so just to say a little bit about that, um, you know, Eli has been a vice chair uh, for the last little bit, so we have both continuity with the, the current leadership and experience running meetings and dealing with the officer's briefing, those sort of things, and you know, continuity has been one of the important values in selecting an officer slate. And similarly, uh, Kat kind of taking the emeritus role and, and the officer group to help with the transition. We appreciate that. Uh, Andre did a similar thing when he stepped down as chair. Uh, and then with Steph, um, you know, Steph has only been on the commission very briefly, uh, but I've known her for a long, long time and have watched her in various leadership positions from, uh, you know, organizing a national conference here in Portland to setting up a nonprofit that was the umbrella for a bunch of advocacy organizations to uh, good work for city bureaus, uh, both this bureau and other bureaus in the city, uh, and most recently uh, running the Portland Underground Graduate School. So I am confident that Steph will bring her considerable leadership role skills to this slate. Thank you. Do I have a second for that slate? That motion? Well, thank you, Katie. Yeah. Any discussion regarding that? <laughs> okay. Of course. I just want to... Um, Thank you. Um, I'm terrified uh, uh, and feel my newness, and so I'm I'm really grateful to this commission for uh, uh, really bringing uh, the new folks along very quickly on some nuanced projects. So I'm I'm just grateful to everyone. Go ahead, Eli. If I can get my oh, up working. Thank you. Well, it would be an honor to serve. Um, it would be a I've climbed a big learning curve, and I know that you're climbing it too, all of us are. 
Um, and I got to say for Kat, um, when I joined this commission and you were chair, um, there was a sort of a, I had to get family permission to keep serving on a commission like this with this much time commitment. And that relies on a group, the whole officers and staff that really makes our time worthwhile. And we get to grapple with real decisions and you ran a damn good meeting. And I've almost, I've yanked myself from a panel previously that this wasn't well managed. So I think that that's something that I hope we keep going on. It takes the officers meetings, it takes the staff support um, to make sure we use our time well, especially with an unwieldy group of 11 folks with strong opinions. Um, and you've done an awesome job of that. And so I hope I can keep that going. Thank you, that's sweet. What was that, Mike? <laughs> Wrong opinion. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I, I was reacting to the unwieldy group. <laughs> well, right. It was a double. Tip. <laughs> no, I do. We all get might to, be true. <laughs> we, we we could chase a lot more squirrels than we do. <laughs> do we all get to weigh in? Because I just want to say, Kat, you've been a wonderful. I mean, I think you've been. I believe you've been the chair the whole time I've been on because the first year I didn't even know what was going on. So I wouldn't even have known who was the chair. But um, no, I appreciate um, your leadership and I know how hard it is to run meetings. It's just hard to run meetings and then to have them go as smoothly as they have. It's been great. And you, you ha you're friendly and you are um, obviously know what you're talking about every time you open your mouth. And I just love that. Um, I, I must fool some people. <laughs> well, then that's Poker good. Face. Well, then that's good too. <laughs> so anyway, and also the new slate, I'm I'm really pleased about too. And I, I really like this thing that I I'm just realizing that you do, which is um, have a chair, and then the chair goes down to the vice chair. That I think that makes a lot of sense. So I I appreciate that. The leadership is well thought out and has been for a while. And welcome the two of you, you know. And so, I'll, I'll second both of those. Yeah. Kat, you've done a great job. Oh, thank very you. Very impressive. And we're, we're lucky to have Eli step in and Steph, so Thanks. very good. Steph and Eli will be fabulous, no doubts. Okay, are we ready to take the roll call on that? Okay, Julie. Okay, back, back. Uh, and I just also want to repeat what I said at our retreat and what Katie and Mike have said. You really have done a great job, and it's not the easiest. I've been chair of other commissions, and they were not as unwieldy as this one, and so you really done, played the role well. So thank you. Thank the new officers, and I'm happy to vote aye. Porto Opso? Yes. Hauk? Yes. Larsel? Yes. Quinones? Yes. Routh? I'm really delighted at the prospect of spending a lot more time with you. Yes. <laughs> Smith. Aye. Spivak. Yes. Schultz. Yes. It passes unanimously. I was almost like starting my tally here, and I'm like, I think I could probably <laughs> count out no's if they happen. <laughs> and well, I know. That's why I started my tally. <laughs> but I think I was going to remember how many no's happened if they did. So, I, again, thank you, everybody. It's, it's, been, a, it's been a true honor. And... Um, I'm looking forward to having Eli take the reins. I, I have a gavel that was a gift from some people at work and I meant to bring it today to let you play with it. I was gonna have to take it back. <laughs> um, okay, next item on the agenda is the um, River District Master Street Plan update. This is a hearing and a recommendation. Welcome. Hello. Hey, that works. Okay. Uh, officers, thank you for having me. Um, I'm here. Uh, my name is Nick Falbo. I'm a senior transportation planner with the Portland Bureau of Transportation. And I'm here for a hearing and recommendation on a proposed update to the River District Master Street Plan. This is following up on a briefing that we held last month. The proposed update of the River District Master Street Plan, uh, this is a part of our transportation system plan. It regulates the layout of new streets and pedestrian connections in key areas of our city. Uh, the plan in the past previous versions of this Master Street Plan have helped build out the streets and connections through the Pearl District as it has developed 
over the last 30 years. And that area right in the center of the map is uh, the part that's kind of left. The area with the black lines. That's the United States Post Office site, which is undergoing a, a, a long-term multi, a master plan process that is now advancing through uh, the Design Commission uh, kind of as we speak. Um, the United States Post Office site concept uh, really designed to bring the uh, conventional street grid through this site uh, while still having a few uh, unique special characteristics. And as the master street plan update can reflect a lot of these new streets, you can see on this map where uh, providing new street connections through Kearney, through Johnson, through Park Avenue, as well as pedestrian connections on 8th Avenue uh, on Irving, uh, and a new connection for the Green Loop. And all of those changes and recommendations are being advanced as a part of the Master Street Plan update. Uh, the existing Master Street Plan, you can see on the presentation to the to image to the left, uh, it has much of these core street grid connections. I think that's has been established through the Master Street Plan historically, this idea that we're reestablishing the street grid. But now that we've got a proposal as a part of the Master Street uh, Master Plan for the site, uh, we're making a few changes. In a couple cases, we're removing streets. This is the frontage road along Broadway, as well as Irving Street through the a new expanded North Park blocks. Uh, and a modification to change uh, what was originally proposed as a pedestrian connection on Kearney into a full street connection. Um, that key change, going from a full street to a pedestrian, uh, sorry, pedestrian connection to a full street, was made as part of discussion about uh, what kind of place we're creating, what are the functions of these streets as they serve the site. Uh, pedestrian connections uh, have a lot of flexibility in how they're implemented. The right of way standards for this part of town are very clear about what streets should be, but they leave that question of full street uh, pedestrian connections open to the designers of pr uh, private works, uh, uh, private developments to design the street. Uh, they can work really well for pedestrian oriented access, access to uh, entrances of buildings and active land uses, and they can also permit motor vehicle access. So while it's considered a pedestrian connection, that doesn't mean uh, no vehicles are allowed. Uh, often these take the form of uh, private drive aisles or driveways to enter buildings, uh, but no through motor vehicle travel is allowed as one of the key attributes. Full street connections though, it's sort of the opposite of that in the sense that if vehicles have full access and and um, the design of the street is much more uh, traditional and typical. You really know what you're going to get when you ask for a full street. Uh, in the USPS site on Kearney in particular, um, one of the things they've tried to do is make Johnson Street the main street for the site. And to do that, that means no driveways, uh, no garage access on Johnson Street. It's supposed to be a very heavy pedestrian environment. And what that means is that other streets start to have to serve that purpose. Uh, so Kearney Streets becomes one of the most uh, heavy vehicular access streets to get to garages to serve these uh, 14 acres of new buildings. Um, so there's not a lot of proposed kind of pedestrian oriented design on Kearney Street. And the thinking uh, through the project team and the discussions with the Design Commission was that a, a full street on this corridor rather than a pedestrian street would help give more activity and eyes on the street rather than create kind of a dead space that not only uh, doesn't have a lot of people there, but uh, is kind of a, a just a, a much quieter street uh, without that active storefront. So we want pedestrians to be on Johnson Street and we want people driving to access these buildings to use Kearney. Uh, some examples of what this might look like, uh, pedestrian connection, here's one on Lovejoy Court, just north of this project site. Uh, it's kind of the, the USPS area. Um, you can see it actually, uh, this is taken from uh, the roadway. So that connection kind of dead ends as a road, but drivers can still enter this driveway, access garages, and there is a little bit of a pedestrian connection, but motor vehicles cannot drive through to connect to other streets. Versus a traditional street, this is a very typical uh, River District street uh, on Overton. Uh, motor vehicle access is allowed, it's designed for, and there is a more of a traditional sidewalk access for pedestrians. So the pedestrian experience isn't necessarily degraded, but it, it does uh, offer a, a more typical street experience. Uh, at the briefing, there was a uh, request for more clarity on how these connections uh, worked in a dimensional way. So uh, I've created this diagram to help illustrate that. Um, you can see the street connections of Kearney and Johnson both connect to Station Way, which travels under 
the Broadway viaduct, so there is street circulation connectivity to Union Station. Uh, the other streets are at grade with Park and uh, Eighth as a pedestrian connection between Johnson and Kearney, and then this green path represents sort of a, the green loop, which has a structure that would rise over Johnson Street, uh, cross over Kearney, and connect to the Broadway Bridge. Uh, and this is meant to kind of illustrate what that 2D map might look like in more of a dimensional 3D environment. Is that route for the Green Loop um, set now? Or there was some discussion about whether it would be that, or I'm not sure if it was Lovejoy or there was some other alternative. Yeah, as I think the long uh, the planning that's been done for the Green Loop has long term identified the idea that it passes through this site and connects up to the Broadway Bridge. Um, as a part of the master plan process, they did want to do their due diligence, and they looked at alternatives that would go up Broadway or go up Lovejoy, but they all ran into some challenges, and whether that be the experience we're trying to provide or accessibility issues. Um, and so this was uh, reaffirmed as a part of that planning process uh, as a preferred route for the Green Loop to this site. And so with that, I welcome discussion over any of the proposed changes or the uh, aspects under consideration here today. Um, and uh, after discussion, you know, we'd like to ask uh, the commission to accept the proposed um, update to the River District Master Street Plan and to forward it to City Council for a final vote. Thank you, Nick. Um, so I'm already falling down the job. I, this is a hearing and recommendation. So I just want to mention if there's anybody here to testify, um, we'd like you to fill out a testimony card and bring it up to Julie. Um, so while we're waiting to see that, does anybody have any questions for Nick? No? Okay. Julie, did you receive any requests? No, you all just have the agenda for the community process. Great. So I'm, I'm going to ask, could you go back to the slide just with the street? You described all the different street types. But then I want to go back and look and see where they apply. Would that be helpful? Yes. So um, as far as how it's mapped out in the Master Street Plan, uh, new streets, conventional streets, would be run through on Kearney, mm -hmm. um, connecting to Station Way. And then Johnson Street, also a new street, but uh, considered a special, uh, it'll be a special design uh, in the site, but it's a new full street with vehicular access bicycle access and pedestrian access, as is the extension of Park Avenue, a new full street with vehicle access, pedestrian access, and bicycle access. Uh, these other streets kind of uh, coded in a kind of a brick color are pedestrian connections that are proposed on Irving uh, on both sides between 9th and Broadway with a kind of a gap through the large new park, which is yet to be designed, and along 8th Avenue, uh, from Gleason all the way up to Kearney, and you can see also two pedestrian connections, one on Park, one on 8th between Johnson and Kearney. And uh, technically, the Green Loop is also classified as a pedestrian connection in the Master Street Plan, which diagonally connects uh, across Kearney to the Broadway Bridge. Okay, I'm going to ask one more time, is there anybody here to testify? No movement in the room, so with that, we'll close the hearing. Are there any further questions? None coming up. I think we can take a vote. So for those who are, um, well, does somebody want to make a motion for a vote? See, I'm still learning. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I'll motion. Nice. Say what you're motioning for. So, to approve, approve um, what is in front of us. So we have a motion on the table to approve the um, River District Master Street Plan, plan as updated. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Daisy and Eli. Any further discussion? Okay, now we can take the roll. Yes. Bordelazzo? Aye. Hauk? Yes. Larcel? Yes. Quinones? Yes. Routh? Aye. Smith? Aye. Spivak? Yes. Schultz? Yes. Passes unanimously. Thank you so much for your time today, Nick. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Appreciate it.
Next item on the agenda is the expanding opportunities for affordable housing. This is a briefing. Welcome, Eric. I guess I'll take it disclosures at this point. Um, I have been in conversations. This is not a real conflict of interest, but I want to disclose that I've in the past been in conversations with one church in my neighborhood. Um, there's nothing active there, and I feel I can participate in this project. However, the zone, specific zone changes, I might ask to bow out of that vote on that property. And I'll make a similar disclosure. I represent a, uh, a church east side that has an application land use application pending to do pretty much what this plan would allow for they've already submitted so this will not have a direct bearing on them and I, so I, I as with eli i don't think it rises to even a potential conflict if something changes and it does i would restate my conflict risk so just a heads up and i think it also gives me some benefit because i've gone through a process and see exactly what we're trying to fix with this package of amendments. All right. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Eric Engstrom with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. Um, and I'm here to talk about the expanding opportunities for affordable housing project. Uh, this is, I want to start by thanking Metro. This is a Metro funded uh, project uh, grant. Um, and the, the purpose of it was to look at um, community mission-based organizations that have land resources and an interest in development of affordable housing and see what we could do to identify barriers to that, um, including uh, capacity, expertise, financial barriers, regulatory barriers. Um, and uh, what I'm bringing you today is a, is a proposal to streamline some regulatory barriers. The grant overall um, had a wider discussion of some of the other barriers, and I'll, I'll go through that briefly. I um, want to thank uh, Nan Stark, who has been the staff person on this project. She's out this week, so I'm the one giving the presentation, but she did most of the work. Um, so um, I just said some of those things. Um, the project involved um, some case studies of three different organizations to look at design and feasibility analysis and financial plans for uh, potential housing on their sites. Um, Carlton Hart Architecture and the Nielsen Group provided consulting services. Um, Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon was a grant partner in this and um, helped manage some community events and networking opportunities. Um, there was also a technical advisory committee, including BDS, Housing, Prosper Portland, BES, and PBOT. I want to thank them for their uh, assistance on this. Uh, the, the three organizations receiving services through the case studies included the Mus Muslim Community Center, Bethel AME, Economic Development Corporation, and Trinity Lutheran. So as I mentioned, um, the idea behind this grant was to look at barriers uh, that community organizations with land might face when they're doing, uh, trying to move forward on an affordable housing project. So potential barriers included the, the pre-development costs and, and, and uh, issue identification, the land use review process, the permitting process, uh, and then finally infrastructure requirements and associated costs. Some of the solutions that were discussed included um, uh, both the zoning code and map amendments I'm bringing you today, but also BDS has moved forward with uh, identifying a point person to help um, shepherd some of these projects through the permitting process. And this is something that they do with many projects, provide the it's kind of a concierge-like service. Uh, this is not a new activity for them, but the, being specific about th this particular niche is, is uh, more recent. Um, and then infrastructure funding um, was discussed um, uh, the infrastructure question is fairly complex and there's not a specific recommendation I'm bringing you today with that. Th those are ongoing discussions um, and need to be considered with other city needs in terms of priorities. So um, I'm going to talk briefly about the code changes that we're bringing forward. There's several different um, pieces which I'll go over in the subsequent slides. 
The first is to allow a parcel to be removed from a conditional use site without having to amend the conditional use permit. And I guess I should back up just a, one step and just say that um, through this grant, what we looked at was institutions that exist in residential neighborhoods as conditional uses. And about 70%, 80% of those are faith-based institutions, churches, mosques, other institutions like that. Um, there are some uh, other types of institutions in that mix, like uh, fraternal organizations, some private schools um, that show up in that when you look at the whole universe of that. Um, so this is not strictly the faith-based institutions that this code is about. It, it includes them because they happen to be a subset of that. Um, so it allows a, uh, an institution to remove a parcel that they may own within their boundaries from the conditional use permit without having to reopen the permit. Um, it allows housing to be added to the site meeting the base zone standards uh, without amending that existing permit. And again, these are in zones that allow housing by right, but because these institutions are conditional uses, current code requires them to amend their permit, whatever they do, even if it's housing. So this would, this would um, streamline that a little bit. This would allow a slight increase in non-housing floor area before a conditional use amendment is triggered as well. And that's because sometimes these new residential buildings might include non-residential um, institutional uses maybe on the ground floor, like a meeting room or something. And so a little more flexibility with that square footage was seen as a, a helpful thing. Um, for consistency, we're also amending the school sites code um, in the zoning code um, with this. So Eric, quick question. So on these these areas, which are typical, that seems like you're typically putting out large parcel areas within residential neighborhoods. Are you, does a, a new site boundary need to be determined as a part of the process? It's along the lines of um, the parcel boundary. So you could subtract out a parcel through this process and then that would just be, there's, there's not a process, it just would be tracked. Got it. Um, in terms of the housing, it wouldn't necessarily change the boundary of the site. It just allows you to put housing without having to reopen that, that review. Cool. So if there was a subsequent review, we just have to account for that. Um, uh, an issue that's come up with existing code occasionally is how we handle replacement of existing flurry if you're tearing something down and maybe replacing it in place. That there's, so this is cleaning up a little bit of that. Um, uh, conditional use often uh, requires institutions to maintain their parking and um, even if a site is close to transit. Um, so as we've liberalized the parking code in most of the zoning code, it's not unusual for conditional use permits to have parking requirements um, in places where we might not require that in the rest of the code. And so this allows removal of parking for uh, housing development if the site is near transit. Um, and that's that. That's just addressing a, what would probably be a common barrier to, to development of these housing if the conditional use permit specified parking. So why aren't we waiving 100%? The, uh, I, that I would have to go back and talk with Nan about in the decision making. I wasn't in the room when that happened, but that's a good question. I'll, I'll have to get back to you next bit before the hearing. Thank you. So, just to make sure I'm following it, is it reduce what's in the conditional use agreement by fifty percent? So, for instance, if you got a church on a lot in a residential neighborhood, they have to have two hundred stalls. Are you reducing the 200 stalls by 50 percent or are you reducing the fact that you've now put a housing project here it's triggering more parking required in that requirement no you're you're reducing what's there now which presumably is there because of previous conditional use requirements right. okay. um, i should say though that many institutions may have what's called kind of an automatic conditional use and that they're so old that they predate the zoning code but they they're they are given that automatic status because of that. So they may not have had a review, but they may have a certain amount of parking. So it's what, what's there today is where the 50% is measured. Got it. I mean, my, my policy argument would be that anytime I have the choice between storing cars and providing a living unit for people, I'm going to go with the people. <laughs> and Eric, can you clarify what you just said? So you, 
tick cat scenario, conditional use says you have to have 200 parking spaces, 30 year old conditional use. And the church simply does not need 200 parking places anymore. Is there some automatic way they can reduce it without going through a conditional use process? No, not, there's, there, not or, under current code, no. They can go. Can well, there's a one, a one space or four percent is the current code. So you can there's a little bit of wiggle room in current code, but and that I think that was written to deal with stormwater upgrades and things. Okay, so they don't have any. They can't accomplish what Chris is trying to say. Is hey, thirty years ago we wanted two hundred stalls. Clearly, the code doesn't require anything close to two hundred stalls. You don't. Yeah, the the typical way that's accomplished is Major. as you reopen your conditional yeah, use right. permit, okay. you would that's, submit that's a study that shows you don't need that so you, many okay. spaces. And you're then, still going to have to fall back on a conditional use if you want to have any kind of major. Correct. And this permit. would be allowed. So it wouldn't prevent what Chris is saying. If you wanted to do a conditional use review, you could make that case that you don't need any gotcha. through that process. This is just the automatic no review yeah, allowance. That's, that's what I didn't understand. Thank you. So it, it just as maybe a little bit more food for thought for everybody on this. I've happened to I'm no longer working on a project, but this was exactly what we were going through the exercise to try to figure out. Um, you know, the other piece to remember, though, is so again, if you have a very active church um, and you take away all their parking, you may end up with all their parking in the neighborhoods. And so the neighborhoods get, a, I mean, I think, you know, the conditional use, I guess, is just a reminder. It's kind of an agreement between the neighborhoods and this organization um, about kind of had to deal with that situation. So it was tricky, at least when we were going through it. So this next provision is that if a conditional use is required, then this limits it to a type two if the proposal includes housing. So in Jeff's scenario where, say, they decided that they could make the case that they don't need any parking and they want to eliminate all of it, and they so they do go through a conditional use permit for the housing, that could be that would only be a type two under this revision. Eli, go ahead. I'm just thinking it might be helpful to get a little context of why this project's in front of us. Um, and I have a little window into it because I don't, it's a pretty wonky area of the zoning code that I never discovered until a year or so ago. But I mean, churches are hurting out there. Sometimes they have a lot of property. They're trying to sell off part of the property, keep the doors open. And they can't do it because to, under current rules, they have to go through a discretionary conditional use process that could take nine months. Um, and and there may be other, and they're philosophically inclined to try and create some public benefit out of the, the the reluctant land they have to lose. So they've so sometimes affordable housing is a natural way they'd be inclined to make the land available and maybe also um, keep the you know keep the heat on. Um, so and, I don't know if that's a good summary, but yeah, that's what there's, I've heard. I guess there's a, a variation on that too, which is some institutions are not give, not selling the land; they're they're building housing in partnership with a. A, a community organization that builds housing like a CDC or something. Um, so it doesn't mean they're selling it off necessarily. So that, that was the summary of the code changes. We're also changing the zoning and comprehensive plan designations on 11 sites with this project. And again, these are institutions that um, have been stakeholders in the project and have potential interest in housing. The um, the criteria for selecting these sites uh, included that um, that there was adjacent zoning similar to what the, the the change is. So we're not creating islands of high density in the middle of of a different kind of zoning. It's on a corridor or a TSP designated street, uh, so it's close to a major transit or, or corridor. Um, rectifies a split zoning situation. In some cases, some of the housing projects have been complicated by split zoning that makes it harder to move property lines around. Um, so that's that's a few of these. It's in the ownership of a community-based organization or institution uh, and creates a pathway for providing community benefits. And in this case, that's primarily affordable housing, what we're talking about. Um, I mentioned earlier that there are some infrastructure. Um, there was a discussion of infrastructure with this project, and there are two pieces to that. One was an in-depth evaluation of the, the three case studies and what it would take to, to put housing on those sites. Um, the second was identification of any issues on the sites subject to our zone change proposal. As with any zone change, we want to make sure that the 
infrastructure is there to support that change. So I'll talk about both of those. Um, on the case study, um, one, this is a slide of the Portsmouth Union at uh, Lombard and Fisk. This, um, this is an example where, um, That's not the picture. Oh, you're right, this is somebody, it was backwards on the slide here. Um, in this case, this is Trinity Lutheran with a street extension. Um, I think I separated this into two slides and forgot to take the first part off. That's the problem. So um, in this case, th it's a fairly large site with a street connectivity issue. So the cost of that new street to serve the new housing units is significant. Um, and I have a note for what that is here. Bear with me for a moment. Um, yes, the extension is upwards of uh, $400,000. So that's, that's an important consideration. Um, this is Portsmouth, um, and in this case, there's a, a traffic light requirement with the permit to build this that that is um, on the range of three hundred, three or four hundred thousand um, dollars. So, both of those are examples of sites that where we have a mission-driven organization that wants to put in housing, but there's an infrastructure barrier. Um, and that's, as I said, something that uh, we continue to discuss is, is what the right way to finance that is. Um, as I mentioned, we also looked at the uh, infrastructure issues for the zone change sites, and this is just a list. Um, primarily, many of these have no known issues. There are a few street frontage improvement requirements and, and utility extensions needed on a few of them. Um, there are a few with some traffic issues in the vicinity, but nothing that really fails. The, the only one that is notable in, in, the, in the adjacent street really failing from a traffic operations perspective is the Taylor's Ferry at West Portland United Methodist. Um, although I would say that that's probably acceptable because we have a light rail station planned a few blocks away as a mitigating factor. So we're comfortable given those plans and, and that process. Um, this is the project timeline. Um, we're briefing you here today on the 14th. Uh, you have a hearing, I believe, on February 11th, and then uh, we will be at City Council in March or April timeframe. Um, this is our project website here. Um, I'll mention this is part of the new um, city. Uh, it's one of the new city websites that's migrated over to the new structure, so take a look at it. Um, I do have individual maps of the details of each of the zone change properties if you're interested. In the uh, interest of time, I'm not going to go through all that now unless you have questions about any of them. And with that, I think I'm here to take questions. Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, I did have a couple of questions about the zoning map. But I also had a one issue with the whole package. But why don't I just do the two zoning maps? And Eric, I know you may not have been involved in this. so if... <laughs> I may have to come back if yeah, I don't know the but, answer. You know, I just want to point something out. And I'm, I'm not sure how much discussion it warrants. But two, two of the proposed zone changes caught my eye. The first one is, it's on page 32 of the handout. And it's a, it says the owner is Terry Emmert, so a private citizen, and the potential buyer is Hacienda. And I'm just curious or wondering, what's the scenario where we give a private developer the benefit of a free zone change and there's no deal? Is, do we have some guarantee this is going to end up in the ownership of Hacienda, or are we? I hope I'm going to assume that's everyone's intent. But the way real estate and things work out, I'm just wondering what's 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 the city's protection that that doesn't happen? Yeah, it's our understanding that there's a transaction underway, um, and I think you raise a, a reasonable question, and uh, um, so we are kind of tracking that transaction. I, I don't think it's our criteria was not to give zone changes through this project to. Uh, private for-profit entity. Right, so, I and mean, that's what I assume, um, so I just want to be we're, sure. I guess I'll just say we're monitoring the pace of that transaction. Right. And um, and what happens, as often happens in a real estate transaction, it's just not quite there. And yeah. And we send it on to city the, council, and it's the day of the hearing, and no one can produce a... Possible that, uh, that okay. we would change course on this if that hasn't happened. I, I guess I would my, just, I'd want to point that out and hope you monitor it and it doesn't fall through the cracks. 
I'll, I'll add my question to that one. I mean, there's no, is a religious institution involved in this or conditional use involved? I'm just wondering how this, yeah, it's a, I'm sure there are lots of sites there's that would like to be rezoned. There's uh, a community-based organization that's in the process of purchasing the site. Is the, it, so, uh, Hacienda. Sure. Do, do you expect that this list of 11 sites is going to grow? As you may get testimony from other entities. You know, as I said, we had criteria and we screened quite a few. Um, there were many projects that could benefit from the code that I described earlier and didn't necessarily need to be rezoned in order to accomplish what they wanted. So that was another factor. But I would anticipate that you'll get some testimony from institutions that may want to be in the in the list. So, so as we get the request for free zone changes. Um, do you have any guidance for screening? Because I guess there's one world of faith-based communities who were maybe the original funding source of this project through Metro, but there's a much bigger world of potential sites where there's a lot of affordable housing money going out the door right now where if, if I were one of them, I'd be asking us for a free zone change. And I'm wondering, if, you, if should we be open to any of those ideas, which this would be an example of, or should we have a narrower real focus? Well, that's why we we were careful to write down criteria, and so I guess we would start from the criteria that we used and uh, and go from there if you have questions. But but I think that it's not intended to be a call for free zone changes. It's it's intended to be a path for projects that may be in a pipeline. Eric, just so, a follow up. Do you have the criteria with you that you can share or follow? follow up with yeah, the commission members. It's in the report and I mentioned it verbally in, in an earlier slide. It, it's um, the the criteria I'll just read through it again was the, we wanted these sites to be adjacent to the zoning that we're page, changing it to. A page we could follow along with or I'm not sure. Okay. To be honest. So I, I know um, you're not the author of this. So, um, so being neck, we didn't want to create island zoning that was just one site. So it had to be something that would be easy to just move a line and incorporate. Like if it's a commercial corridor and we're just adding that institution to the corridor. Um, second was that it's it's on a TSP collector street or greater, so we're not impacting local streets. Um, we included some. Uh, properties that where there was a split zone problem that was a barrier to getting a property line adjustment um, is in the ownership of an institution or community based organization. And as Jeff pointed out, there's one that we're tracking that is on the edge of that criterion. Um, and we wanted there to be a pathway for providing community benefits. In other words, there's a real interest in that organization in providing affordable housing and that there's some movement on that. It's not just a, a dream that they've never worked on. And for other commission members, it's on page 23. Thank you. So, you, you, okay, oh, well. and I should say, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely supportive of getting community benefit out of these agreements. I'm just trying to figure out how big the universe is because I, yeah. um, th there's a lot of groups trying to do this kind it's of. It's a good housing. question. A, a lot like what we encountered during the comprehensive plan update. When you do a project like this with multiple sites, it's inevitable that someone else is going to raise their hand and make a case. So you should be prepared for that. And I guess last question: or Is everyone aware that these are not really our R2, R1 anymore, they're RM1, or they sh is that being taken into account that we're looking at the new rules? Yeah, we um, started this project and, and we're straddling the adoption of Better Housing by Design. So we started this with the old rules and a as you convey your recommendation to council, it would we would recommend that you include a sentence that the intent is that this move to the, the new um, structure uh, and um, as we notify people at the council hearings, we're going to make a note of that in their in their notices that this is revised because of the update in Better Housing by Design. So, so I have a question, and then Katie. Yeah, I, I I was just wondering. Um, it to me it seems like a good idea that if more are found and they're wanting to uh, do this very same thing, that we would we would work them in to the council and we would give them free um, the same deal that that these churches got and other you know other religious organizations so um, uh, I think that's great I mean I, I think we should be doing that and, and perhaps even for do we do that for um, other low-income um, uh, housing providers do we give them uh, free zoning changes the uh, well, there's there's two ways to get a zone change. Uh, you can make an application 
or a comprehensive plan change, you can make an application through the Bureau of Development Services, and there's a fee for that. Um, there are some fee reductions pathways available through BDS for land use reviews that is um, are somewhat limited, but it, but exist. The other way is this is a legislative project where BPS is bundling a group together. Um, there's not a fee for that, and so that you know um, we don't do one of these packages every year. This is a little bit unique because of this grant and the and the specific thing we were targeting, but uh, it's not unusual for when we do a legislative project that involves changing the zoning map that people ask to be included or not included. And, and so that's that's the second, that's what this path, that's what's happening here. Okay, so in other words, this is a one-time deal. Is that what you're trying to say? Yes, this project yeah. is a one-time project. We don't have a rolling legislative project to collect these kind of I'm wondering if changes. we should is what I'm I'm kind of that's what I'm kind of putting forth I'm wondering if we should because um if I know that churches that there's like some some churches are going to be it's the 80 20 rule they're just going to be right on it they're going to jump in they're going to want to build and others are going to take longer and so there's there's going to be more potential as time goes on they'll see the successes from other churches and um, and other religious organizations, and they'll think that's really great. That's what we should be doing too. And um, so there's going to be, uh, you know, this this group that are that are already on board. They're the ones that are, you know, ready to roll, and they they've got their mission, and they're going to go with it. But the, uh, later on, there's going to be more that will want to to be a part of it. And I would think that. Um, if there is indeed a housing emergency, which we all know as we drive around, um, we should be trying to encourage as much of this as we can, especially since these, oftentimes these um, organizations are gonna make less requirements on the profit that they get off of their land. That's, that's, a, that's a huge deal, you know? So anyway. So Jeff? Jeff has his hand up, and I, I see Chris has his hand Two up more questions, and I'll be done. One's a zone change, and one's a different issue. I, I'd also just like an explanation or justification, and if you can't give it today, that's fine, but we've got one zone change on page 34 where we're taking a residential zone site and turning it into a commercial mixed-use site. And as I look at the map, it's not... Doesn't, it's not clear to me that it's justified by the surrounding zoning. This is the one for on Williams for Self Enhancement Inc. Again, I just think it's worth a short explanation for why taking it out of residential and putting it into commercial is consistent with the whole idea. We want to encourage and help these churches, community groups do more housing. And this doesn't seem intended to necessarily do that. So again, I, I just would like someone to say yes but here's why we thought it was it was appropriate the this site um it's my understanding that this uh, site has some non-residential use on it in terms of a, a community organization and interest in providing some community based uh, services or, or um, facilities uh, which wouldn't be allowed in a residential zone so that's that's the intent here uh, there may or may not be housing i'm not sure Okay. And I, I also want to just disclose that um, I own property around this block, and <laughs> I was not involved with the crafting of this particular proposal, so I can't probably fully answer your question. And, and, and I certainly don't <laughs> want to cause any problems for self-enhancement. I'm just sort of wondering to be consistent. But, but here's my biggest issue, and I'll go ahead and raise it now if you don't mind. This is just real quick to, to piggyback on what you're saying. Okay. Perhaps um, just maybe an explanation that it's, it's 11 sites, right? Are there others? Just maybe a one or two sentence, like it hit why this is hitting these different criteria will help us when we move forward. I'll leave it at that. Go ahead, Jeff. Okay, and this is final issue, and I briefly sent Eric a note. And Eli and I have talked about it, and this is this is an issue that came up during RIP, which is, can't we find a way to streamline or even eliminate the subdivision requirement in these projects? And here's here's a scenario. Uh, getting rid of a conditional use will be very helpful in terms of cost and timeline. But you don't accomplish anything if the property still has to go through a subdivision because that's even more expensive and takes even longer. So you, 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 
you solve a small problem, but you haven't solved the big problem. And the scenario I've seen, and this is the case I worked on, is church owns a big piece of property. Let's just hypothetically say it's 10 acres and their church use is on five acres. So they want to take the other five acres and either develop housing themselves or sell it to a housing developer. And in most scenarios, they're going to have to go through a zone change. Twenty, thirty thousand dollars 30000 12 months. In some cases, just to create one separate lot. And this is like the scenario, if you recall, we talked about in RIP, where if you want to build a fourplex as condominiums and sell them, you can do it without a subdivision process. If you want to build a fourplex and sell them as four sale separate units, boom, you go through this expensive, long process. So you end up with the exact same physical product. One doesn't have to go through subdivision, the other one does. So we talked about that in RIP and felt we didn't want to add to RIP a change in the subdivision code. But this seems like a good opportunity to revisit that. We're trying to help churches, nonprofits. Uh, and so I know, because this discussion's come up, there's always sort of some issues and questions about, well, here's why it's difficult to do. And well, this, you know, you know, so I understand it's, it's not a simple fix. But I gotta believe it's a realistic, doable fix that would have real tangible benefits for accomplishing what this package is intended to accomplish. Helping community-based, faith-based organizations more move in a more streamlined way to get more housing and to get the money they need to survive. So I would, and Eric, I suspect you're as good as anyone in the department on this. There's, there's got to be a way to figure out how to do this. And so I, I guess I have three thoughts on, on your statement. Um, one is we have had some discussions with the commission about the need or interest in potentially looking at the land division code overall and, and looking at ways to streamline for housing. So that's still something that can be discussed in the sense of our future work program and budgets. Um, so that's one thought. Um, uh, second thought is, of course, that the, land, the subdivision code is in state law, so it's not a simple fix from a city-only perspective. There would, to totally exempt something from the subdivision process would probably involve state law changes as well, and that's that went pretty far beyond the scope of we thought this project. Um, and then I guess a third perspective is just there are some substantive differences between like a condominium project and a subdivision in the sense of um, the subdivision may result in some public infrastructure or public streets or public sewers and water, and generally the condominium is providing private infrastructure. So there, there can be some, albeit po many of this, much of this is underground, but infrastructure differences between the, the, what you end up with when you go the condo route versus the, the subdivision route. Um, I don't disagree with your statement that that is something we should look into. Uh, we didn't because it was a potentially larger can of worms, frankly. Thank you. I'll, I'll be done with one last comment. Eric, you and I have worked together since your days in the old development services, 30 plus Worked on years. a subdivision together, I think, a few yes. times. <laughs> and, you know, I have enormous respect for your knowledge of the code, but I'm just going to disagree with you. In that one, I gotta believe this can be done without a change to state law. And yes, I understand you have to think through the infrastructure issues. I just have this sense that if a handful of experienced code people like yourself, and I know, uh, I don't wanna speak for the director of BDS, but she's been supportive of this. I don't think it's a long-term work program. I think it's a day of brainstorming, I bet, the right people in the room to come up with a package. Now that may be too much to ask. I know that's not the way we always do things, but it would be such a valuable addition to this process if we could do that. So I'm done. I don't know if there's the momentum or the interest to try to do that, but I, I wish we could in this context, because I don't think we'll ever have a better vehicle to sort of put it into place and see how it works. So thank you. I really do appreciate all your efforts on this. Chris. So to to Jeff's point, um, I'm aware that there are people preparing testimony for council around RIP who are going to ask for the same thing, that uh, we make fee simple ownership easier by having a, a saner division process. So there's multiple forces hopefully converging on this problem, and maybe we can find a way to seize that opportunity. Uh, with regard to more churches or institutions coming forward and wanting to take advantage of the rezoning opportunity, let me ask the practical process question. 
if we get written testimony in advance of the hearing for this, making those requests, is staff going to be able to provide us with an analysis of whether they meet the criteria or not? And two, if we get verbal testimony on the day, is staff going to be able to provide us a very quick screening to say whether or not those requests meet the criteria? Well, without having seen the requests, I'll, I, I'm more solid on your first part in terms of if we if we see a written one, we can probably <laughs> provide you with some recommendation. Um, if it arrives the day of, depends on the details, um, we may need a little follow-up time to provide a recommendation. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Yeah, I do. I just, um, I was I was wondering if there was any, um, you know, we've been dealing with really um, wonderful organizations that are um, thinking in terms of mission. Is there any way that somebody could um, actually use these changes to, um, you know, do something that we're not interested in them in doing? Uh, yeah. Um the zone changes are zone changes outright, so I can't guarantee that those institutions are going to build affordable housing. You know, it, churches end up, under current code, uh, churches can go out of business or I don't know what the right term is, but churches can cease operations and right. and uh, their sites can end up in different uses. And, and I can't control that, If uh, especially on the sites that we're rezoning to mixed use. I, I can't you know, control the type of use that, that that might get put there. Right. Well, I guess one of the things I was thinking of, and I couldn't really imagine if it would happen or not, but that somebody might just put one house there and maybe it's a very fine house for their minister or something. You know, um, is there anything that would stop that or, um, you know? On a site that's vacant, um, there are minimum density requirements. So if, if, if a institution was selling off a parcel it would have to, and it was a freestanding parcel it would have to meet minimum density when it was developed um, if 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 a, an institution is adding housing units to a site we didn't specify the number so if they're keeping the property in one ownership it, it is possible to just add incrementally to a site if it's all still in one ownership um, moving towards density Mm-hmm. Okay. Ben had his hand up, and then Eli, but go, feel free to finish. Okay, I'm trying to remember what my last question was. Um, what's the worst thing that can happen? <laughs> Fast track for zoning changes. Oh, just um, what is left to do? I mean, it seems like what we're talking about now is the very beginning of the um, journey that these institutions are going to be taking to you know, finally come up with um, uh, housing, finished housing that people can move into. Um, so do you see other barriers that they're going to run into? Yes. Um, many of these projects don't yet have financing, so that's a that's going to be a journey to, to identify and secure that. And then, as I mentioned, a few of them have infrastructure issues and that we don't yet have a path to pay for those improvements. Okay. So none of these are a guaranteed so project most, yet. And most of it is the financing? Yeah, because the infrastructure boils down to money, too. <laughs> yeah, it really would. Yeah. Okay. And is there any um, movement afoot to, um, around that issue? Yeah, there's ongoing discussion, I think. And it, as I think was discussed earlier, there are a variety of paths to, to get financing for affordable housing, some through the city, some through other entities. And um, some of these projects are pursuing those paths now. Some are more in the preliminary stages. Because I could imagine that if there was solutions that were, um, that they discover, that it would be nice to bundle those and and uh, make sure that other um, organizations are learning about them too. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and that was, yeah. that's one aspect of this grant that I didn't talk about too much, but there has been a lot of, uh, part of the grant was to hold a number of uh, coordination and networking events for the institutions. So they, there's been a few times over the course of this grant where a group of institutions have gathered and compared notes, and mm -hmm. we are compiling kind of a, a handbook or a guidebook um, so related it, to the work. Is it going to go on past the end of the uh, of this uh, project? or? 
the the legislative up to them it's up to them the the grant we're just about done with and the and when we will finish this legislative change to the zoning code um but some of the networks that have been generated by the grant will continue privately mm -hmm. okay that's that's it thanks i find Je uh, jeff's suggestion to um look at potentially streamlining the subdivision code as a, as a future uh, um, endeavor very enticing I totally agree with Eric that this is a you know another and bigger can of worms so obviously it shouldn't impair the the process of this specific project but I'd like to suggest that um, perhaps we look at this a little bit more closely and see if uh, Maybe we have an informal scoping session or just, just exploratory more than scoping actually really really early on. Maybe a sub subgroup of us and maybe staff to look at ways that we could tackle this. I do think it could have potential big benefits in, in you know, removing or, or lowering the barrier to home ownership. Well, I'm gonna quickly jump in. Um, is there support for a subgroup or a working group of the PSC to get together um, and brainstorm this with ideally staff support. Is that something we can pull together, Andrea? And if you need to get back to me, that's fine. I was going to say, if, if you thought so, that I could say, let's just pull a group and kind of put it out there and get it going. Yeah, I think um, let me let me take it back to the team. Um, it, you know, Obviously, that, that body of work will affect our current body of work, so we would just need to um, look at when, when that opportunity, when that would make sense. So let me let me come, go back to the team and then come back to you. Just point of information, uh, DRAC, which is sort of our sister agency, or group, did an informal look at this, I'm going to guess a year ago maybe, and there was a memo which sounded as if, almost as if Eric had written it saying, well, here's all the barriers to doing it, and it kind of died out. So, but... And I felt the same way when I saw that memo. I don't think I wrote that one. No, you did, but <laughs> but I think it aside all the things. Well, there's state law. There's interest. Yeah. Uh, so. Well, perhaps uh, at a minimum, I just could that, we get that circulated amongst uh, the group, and we can always pass along ideas too, yeah. on our own time. Okay. I don't know if that's encouraging or discouraging, but I'm just it's point information. Uh, Eli, pass it on. I, I just wanted to say I support. Jeff's suggestion as well. And there are other jurisdictions in the same state of Oregon that managed to go faster than Portland. So as part of this review, if we get to do it, it would be nice just to compare our process with the process of another jurisdiction that gets partitions done in half the time. Any other comments, questions? I think that's all we have for now. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And we're going to see you back, it looks like, for a hearing on February 11th. You or Nan, one of you. Yes, one of us, and um, I think I'm staying at the table because the next item involves me too. So great. Okay, so the um, next item on the agenda is the Montgomery Park to Hollywood Transit and Land Use Development Study. Um, this is a briefing. I um, don't have a true conflict, but just in the interest of all transparency, um, I'm working on a project that may be along this line, depending on where the line ends up. So I'm not going to participate in any discussion on the briefing. I'm going to hand the gavel over to Eli and just listen in since it's a briefing only. So and for you. purposes of transparency, uh, I'll just disclose to my colleagues and folks who may be watching this that uh, I have served as a member of the Portland Streetcar Board of Directors for a number of years, even predating my service on this commission. Uh, not a conflict of interest because, like this job, that one doesn't pay me either. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it does provide a policy perspective that you know, will probably show up here. So just want people to be aware. And that's why we have three officers, so we can all be involved in projects outside the PSC. <laughs> um, if staff, I'm not sure who's going to present, so please introduce. I'll start. Is this mic working? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, again, my name is Eric Engstrom with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. And with me here is Kate Drennan uh, with PBOT and Barry Manning with BPS. They are the project managers for this work. Um, and we're here today to talk about um, uh, the streetcar Montgomery Park to Hollywood transit and land use development strategy. They will uh, give the presentation. Primarily, I'm here to help answer questions and um, participate in the follow-up. 
Um, and while they're looking for the PowerPoint, I guess um, I'll just mention that this is a um, Federal Transit Administration funded grant um, and there's um, they'll talk about it, but we did also some work with city funding last year, which produced an interim product and we're embarking now on a more public process over the next 12 months um, on further work. And are you guys ready to take sure. it from there? Hello, thanks for having us. So we're gonna just start off with a little bit of background um, about why we're doing this. So first off, uh, as many of you probably know, Streetcar began operating in 2001 between Northwest Portland and PSU. We were one of the first American cities to begin operating a modern American streetcar. Um, we found that at the streetcar investment uh, went really well. We've done subsequent expansions and we have found that it's created a high quality, well-used green transportation mode that spurred investment, redevelopment, but also some important um, housing within our central city. In 2009, we created a streetcar system plan. Um, it identified several potential corridors that you can see on the screen, including all of those green and yellow corridors. And two of those were lines to serve Hollywood Transit Center and Montgomery Park. Fast forwarding a little bit, in 2016, uh, Portland Streetcar Inc. funded an evaluation of six promising corridors uh, with support from consultants. And two of those most prominent corridors prominent corridors again were Montgomery Park and Hollywood District. Building on that, last year City Council gave both PBOT and BPS um, a sum of about $370,000 to look specifically at a streetcar extension to serve Montgomery Park and then what the land use implications would be for that district. Um, during that process, we also applied and were awarded an FTA grant to study the land use and transit moves both in Northwest but also in Northeast Portland to get to the Hollywood Transit Center. So we're gonna take just a second to talk about that first phase that was funded through um, City Council to give you kind of an update on that and because it's really foundational for this next phase of the project that we're moving into. So this is what we looked at um, over the past year in 2018, 2019, it was our phase one study. You can see that the red line right now is the existing streetcar and the blue is the potential um, streetcar extension that we studied. And this is the area that we looked at. Um, we looked specifically at the land use implications in that darker gray area. That's where we looked at a scenario of uh, land uses, and that's really north of Vaughn, south of Nikolai, um, east of about Northwest 27th, and then west of the Railroad. So in that study, we looked at five land use scenarios that really represented a spectrum of change. Everything from um, existing conditions under the comprehensive plan today, which was no change, um, to something sort of a moderate change that might look like a central east side industrial district, all the way up to uh, significant mixed use development, kind of on the scale of the Pearl District. We looked at the implications for all five of these different scenarios in terms of what it could mean for housing creation, job creation, and also the different mix of uh, jobs that would be created under each of these scenarios. We also did an initial equity analysis um, during this phase, really asking the two questions of, you know, would a land use change support our city objectives to help make our city more equitable? And would the proposed changes in investments either reduce or exacerbate long, long standing disparities across our city? And so we have a great report that um, our group put out. The, Preliminary scan didn't answer, didn't kind of come to a conclusion, but did uncover a number of benefits and burdens and also generated some ideas for us to explore. And it's really gonna serve as a basis for the next phase of study where we'll be doing a deeper analysis on that work. And Barry will talk a little bit about that as well. So this is uh, the cover of the study, just to tell you that this phase one is available online. We're also happy to send it out um, to the PSC if you'd like. So you can check out that first phase. So now we're kind of moving to this new second phase that's building on that. And a lot of the questions we're getting as we go out into the community is sort of why are we doing this now and why a streetcar? And so for the why now, um, the past few years have really seen some pretty significant changes in the Northwest District, particularly north of Vaughan. Um, some stalwarts like Montgomery Park have changed ownership. Uh, Long-standing industrial businesses like ESCO have closed. Um, they've also sold, and the underlying land was upzoned in the last comprehensive plan. Uh, 
the site's been raised, it's empty. There are other underutilized properties um, in that area. And so there's kind of an opportunity right now to proactively shape a new neighborhood district if we wanted to go that direction. There's also a lot of momentum um, in the form of support from property owners in that area. They have self-organized to um, explore creating a um, local improvement district that would look at um, funding some transit investments and land use changes. And on the east side, um, when we applied for this FTA grant, we saw an opportunity to do some of the initial analysis uh, on the east side to explore some of the potential alignments that we've been thinking about for a while, but haven't really gotten an opportunity to evaluate feasibility or public or stakeholder support. So this is kind of an opportunity to do some of that initial um, look at the northeast side. And then why a streetcar investment? Um, we will be looking at some other transit alternatives as well. But um, you know, streetcar extensions have been studied and recommended in numerous plans. Um, these alignments are in our transportation system plan, our regional transportation plan, our comp plan. So uh, we have been looking at them for a while. We've also found that the streetcar is really a highly effective transportation tool. Um, the ridership is as high as our busiest bus lines. Uh, people really do ride the streetcar and it, and it moves um, quite a few people every day. Just recently, since adding some cars back in 2019, our weekday ridership increased 24% in two months, which was very positive. Um, we also have seen that it's a really equitable transportation mode. It serves a more diverse ridership and a transit dependent ridership than other modes in our region. 35% uh, of riders earn less than 30,000 a year. A quarter are use our honored citizen fare. 81% um, are part of low or no car households. So, um, we have seen that really it's a good way to move uh, a wide spectrum of people and people that are really dependent on getting around our city. Um, also, streetcar investments have historically generated development agreements that have created a lot of our affordable and mixed income housing, uh, which is a big priority for the city. <clears throat> so about nearly 40% of our affordable housing is within a quarter mile of streetcar lines today. So as we approach this study, some of the key questions that we're considering is really how would land use changes and transportation investments best complement the goals and policies of the city? You know, do these investments make sense in terms of helping us meet our mode share goals, our goals to reduce single op occupant trips, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to increase housing choices and affordability, creating dense walkable communities, all these things that as a city we wanna do would these investments help us sort of get there? And so I'm gonna hand off to my colleague, Barry, to talk a little more specifically about the elements of this plan. Great. Thanks, Kate. Barry Manning with Planning and Sustainability. So I'm gonna walk you through some of the details of the alignment and the study to kind of set the groundwork for what we're uh, engaging in right now. So this graphic shows the two areas that we're studying in more detail. And on the left-hand side in beige is the uh, northwest area that Kate described that was the subject of the phase one study. Uh, essentially, the alignment would uh, head off the existing streetcar system up 18th and 19th and come over I-405 and then head out towards Montgomery Park along uh, northwest Wilson and northwest York. So that's in this uh, beige area. Uh, represents the study area for the existing conditions report, which we just published and posted on the internet. On the east side, outlined in blue, are three different alternative alignments that we're initially considering for the uh, options to get to Hollywood, Hollywood being out here. Uh, the first one, uh, and these first two were identified in the streetcar system plan, would go out Broadway and Widler, all the way out to Hollywood. Uh, a second one would engage the existing streetcar on uh, Burnside and Cooch and then head out Sandy Boulevard all the way to Hollywood. And a third one that's emerged, and there may be others, but this third one would um, come off the existing streetcar line somewhere in the Lloyd District, head up Lloyd Boulevard across the bridge, across the freeway, and out Irving, hooking up to Sandy and then ultimately getting to Hollywood in that direction. So those are the three that we're looking at on the east side. And I'll show you a little bit more detail on them uh, in these slides. So on in Northwest, again, this shows you the alignment to get to Montgomery Park. And as Kate said, this goes um, through some areas that are currently um, transitioning. Some of the area is zoned industrial, some of it uh, planned or zoned for employment. And then Montgomery Park planned for mixed use and zoned for that way. But this alignment uh, was selected uh, in prior work amongst several that were considered because it provides potential for 
hundreds of new jobs and new housing units uh, that could be spurred with the transit investment. It serves this district that currently doesn't have uh, any grid direct transit access, particularly the area between uh, 18th and 19th and Montgomery Park. Um, this alignment compared to others that traverse the district to get to Montgomery Park through um, routes through Northwest Portland, south of Vaughan, um, provides a more direct route to Montgomery Park, which can lead to a faster and smoother ride for riders. And importantly for a streetcar, um, the line garners support from uh, property owners that help support and pay for the streetcar investment. So that's an important factor as well in, in why this line was selected uh, compared to other alternatives that were considered. On the east side, um, so I apologize for the somewhat busy map, but the three alignments uh, are again, Broadway Widler in orange here at the top. And you can see where that uh, heads out. Um, Sandy and hooking into Burnside and Cooch uh, in green here. And then that Irving alignment coming out of the Lloyd district in yellow here, and then ultimately getting to Sandy Boulevard. And um, we'll talk a little bit about what we're trying to look at in each of these alignments in just a moment here. But before we get into that, I do wanna show you the zoning map for uh, both of these areas so that you get a sense of what the lay of the land is. So first in Northwest, um, the area that along 18th and 19th is largely zoned for mixed use development. That was done in the recent comprehensive plan, uh, largely CM3 zoning in that area, if you recall, which is one of the most intense uh, non-central city mixed use zones. There's a little bit of uh, employment zoning, EG1 in that alignment as well. As it crosses over I-405, it does enter into uh, some prime industrial area and industrial sanctuary areas uh, that are zoned IG1 currently. And the line heading out towards Montgomery Park, which I'm outlining with the mouse here, um, is IG1 zoning all the way out to uh, close to Montgomery Park where it transitions to um, EG employment zoning and then um, the mixed employment zone that's uh, I'm sorry, central employment zone that's applied to Montgomery Park. So the zoning in this area will be a big question as part of this study to determine what the appropriate type of zoning should be in this area and whether streetcar should serve that area. Uh, and it's kind of an iterative question. So we'll be looking at that in detail. On the east side, um, these lines um, all have mixed use zoning. Uh, the Broadway wider line comes through the central city and this dark reddish magenta area is um, mostly CX zoning and it transitions to a mixed use uh, CM2 zoning primarily all the way out to Hollywood until it gets to this reddish area which is zone CM3, a very intense mixed use zone. Along Sandy again, EX central employment zoning along Burnside and Cooch for the most part and then out Sandy uh, in the CM3 zone which was applied during the comp plan. And then finally the er Irving alignment is an interesting one uh, running through an area that had been at one point in time a former uh, light industrial mixed use area that we rezoned uh, many years ago to uh, accommodate more of a mix of uses and it really is evolving into a very mixed use area currently but has a combination of central employment zones, CM3 zoning and some higher density residential zoning in that area as well. So an interesting combination of zones in that area. So some of the outcomes we're hoping to achieve in the uh, Montgomery Park to Hollywood project uh, are, they're different, I should say, on the west side versus the east side. The west side is further along, as uh, Kate has explained. We've done the preliminary phase one study. So on the west side, we're really trying to evaluate whether or not the land use should be changed or, or how should it change to accommodate a transit investment. So we're looking at urban design and key development opportunity sites on that area, on that side. We're looking at developing an equitable development strategy, looking at what kinds of uh, benefits that might be uh, uh, bestowed, public benefits that might accrue if there was a zone change or some kind of a change in use, affordable housing, affordable commercial space, or some other kind of community benefit that could accrue as part of that change. Uh, we are looking at comprehensive plan and zoning changes. Are they appropriate? How do we offset the change in industrial use if that seems appropriate? And we're looking at complementary transportation plan uh, improvements to complement the land use, whatever that ends up being. On the east side, we're really looking, as Kate said earlier, to figure out whether or not one of these alignments makes more sense than the other one for a future streetcar in that area. So we'll be looking at the trade-offs um, 
issues of zoning, whether there would need to be changes in zoning to accommodate a streetcar, uh, whether the lot depths are sufficient for redevelopment that's typically associated with that kind of uh, transit investment, things of that nature. But no zoning change is likely to be proposed at the time of the adoption. I'm sorry, at the time of proposal. So the elements that we're looking at here, um, and this uh, relates to the um, FTA grant, we have a community outreach and engagement plan that we've recently developed and are, we've scoped that out and are initiating some of the work on that. Right now we're doing some information sharing with local associations, business associations, neighborhood associations. We've got a website. Um, we we're going to have larger community workshops at key milestones, but a key element here is that we're doing some targeted outreach to underserved groups. Uh, we have about $50,000 uh, allocated in the FTA grant, uh, sorry, $45,000 allocated in the FTA grant to contract with community-based organizations to do a little bit uh, more in-depth reach to communities that might be impacted by a, a change such as this. Uh, we've identified several of those groups initially and we're reaching out to contract with organizations to, to help us engage those communities. We're planning a sounding board for the Northwest area since we're looking at more detailed work, so we're recruiting for them right now. And then ultimately we will come back to the PSC and city council if there's a proposal for any kind of land use changes. So that will happen um, sometime in December or January of 2020, 2021. As I said, we've just published the existing conditions report. Um, we'll be getting into urban design work in the March, April timeframe and then have another community meeting. And then um, as the process rolls on, we expect to have a discussion draft for land use alternatives in the uh, early fall timeframe. And then again, uh, transportation would follow on that. And then we'd be coming to you for uh, public hearings and more, more information. Um, this graphic shows the uh, timeline and the different uh, components of the study and how they line up. And again, we expect to be coming back to uh, Planning and Sustainability Commission right around uh, winter of, I guess, this new year. Yes. So December, January 2020, 2021. So lots to cover. We'd be happy to answer questions that you might have. Chris. So let me try and frame up some big picture questions. <clears throat> Yeah, I've been involved with streetcar for a long time. I first got involved because you know, I was transportation chair in the Northwest neighborhood when it was being built. And you know, it was a good thing for my neighborhood. And since I've moved into roles with a broader perspective, I've uh, kind of have to look for different motivations for why this happens. Um, what streetcar is good at is creating dense places where people want to live. We create attractive neighborhoods where people want to be and we get a very dense form of development, typically along streetcar corridors. People build to very close to the allowed FAR, so we're, we're getting the zoning, getting the buildings that we zone for, which is a good thing. Um, the first two lines, I, I can see very clear alignment with city strategy. So with the, uh, the first line, it was basically you know, build out the neighborhoods in the Pearl and South Waterfront. So it supported a central city development strategy. We went across the river and we helped also support central city development on the other side of the river and creating the loop. Um, really strong alignment. I'm struggling a little bit here uh, on what, how this corresponds to our existing goals uh, or what opportunities it presents. Um, you know, this would be essentially expanding an inner ring neighborhood, right? Northwest is already a, uh, a town center um, in our planning, so this would kind of grow the Northwest Town Center a little bit. And I'm interested as we explore this to figure out the trade-offs between drawing development there versus letting development happen in other entering neighborhoods. So are we stealing development from somewhere else to put it here? Um, you know, streetcar as a mechanism is really responsive to property owners who say they're willing to help pay for the line, right? People raise their hand and say, we're, we're willing to form an LID. Streetcar gets very enthusiastic about that. And, and that condition exists in uh, you know, in the former ESCO area, um, doesn't necessarily exist on any of the routes that you've outlined to Hollywood. Uh, you know, I think the Hollywood line would be more about making development happen in existing inner ring neighborhoods. Um, so they're, in my mind, they're kind of two different beasts. But then the other aspects are, you know, what does this do for our housing strategy? Um, if we go to Northwest, you know, we're going to make money for some property owners. And the question is, can we recapture a decent portion of that and put it into housing? So uh, as we, if we go that route, do we have a value capture strategy that will work? I think 
if we reflect on streetcar, you know, very successful creating affordable housing in the Pearl, um, not so successful in uh, South Waterfront, open question on the east side as things are kind of you know, evolving more slowly, but we can begin to see uh, housing there, uh, how much of it is affordable is still an open question. So I'd want to see a really strong plan for how, if we go the housing route in that area, and I, uh, I do want to say that clearly the ESCO area is changing. We've got you know, changing use with ESCO departing, we've got a change in ownership there. So we, we definitely need to be thinking about what should happen to that area because it's going to change and we can be part of planning that change or we just let it happen in the market. Uh, I'm all in favor of us being involved from a planning point of view. But, um, you know, do we think that's a housing center? And if so, how do we make sure it's got plenty of affordable housing? So those are the things swirling in my mind. Uh, I'll just uh, try to respond. Um... Chris, I think you've correctly defined or, or identified sort of the meta question of the project, and this is essentially what we're trying to study and come to a conclusion on. Um, streetcar has been a tool historically and in other cities around the country. Of um, It's not, not seen really purely as a transportation investment. It's really about shaping neighborhoods, and it's a package between the transportation and the housing that tends the, the private sector um, is willing to build along the line. Um, and there's a synergy there that, that, that was South Waterfront, that was the, the River District, Pearl District, um, and to some extent Conway that continues that tradition. Um, so it's really about um, a decision and, and stepping back to the comprehensive plan, we have a centers and corridors strategy, but with significant central city growth still planned. Um, if you if you step back to the the urban design diagram in the central city, there is the central city being the largest hub, but there was also an inner ring. I think you used the term, but the on the urban design diagram there was a, an identification of the neighborhoods surrounding the central city with some unique goals for those neighborhoods because we know that um, growth in very close proximity to the central city has a bunch of benefits in terms of walkability to the central city and density that make it a low carbon choice. Um, the central city development has the lowest footprint in terms of carbon footprint compared to some of the other forms we allow in the, in the comp plan. So the, the streetcar question is really about how do we grow the central city over the next 20 to 50 years and where do we want to have that growth be targeted um, as, as South Waterfront and the River District build out. Um, this, the, the, as you mentioned, I think this, the East Side Loop is stimulating further work in the Lloyd Center and and, and the uh, OMSI and, and Grand MLK corridors. Um, the So it's not really a question of, you know, how, what's the best transit to get someone to Montgomery Park. It's, it's what what route would have the most benefit in terms of creating a neighborhood that helps us meet our various goals. And, and that's the same on the east side. It's not so much, if you want to take a train to Hollywood, you would go on the max. The, the, um, the streetcar is more about the route that it takes and what might happen along that route, whether it's Broadway Wadler or Sandy or Irving, um, which of those is best positioned to take on the role of a new central city or central city adjacent neighborhood um, in terms of, of housing and jobs. And um, so it's evaluating those choices. And I, I think you, it, it is a legitimate question. We have a certain amount of growth that we're expecting over 20 years, and, and, and we have to decide where we want to push that growth. And um, so this, this project helps us have that discussion, at least in terms of the near central city growth. Um, I don't have an answer to the questions you pose because that's what we're studying in the project. But, but that's the meta question, I think. Okay, let's go to Daisy and then Ben, if anyone else, let me know. And then Steph. Hi. Kate is one of my professors. Hi, Kate. <laughs> um, okay, I have two questions. One is, it's really great to hear that um, this will probably or likely spur affordable housing development. On the other side of that, I'm just interested to know if there are any plans to do like a displacement risk analysis of both, you know, residential tenants, but commercial or businesses as well. And then my second question, you know, it sounds like there is already a really involved and active, proactive community group of community members with the West Side. But I'm just curious as to do you have a plan to have more robust community engagement or involvement for the East Side? Yep. So I guess I'll take on some of that question. So displacement risk analysis. Um, 
part of our whole equitable development strategy, I think, needs to look at that. So we haven't scoped that out completely, but there'll be a part of that. You mentioned small business displacement. Um, as part of our community-based, our, our engagement with a community-based organization, one of the groups we identified was small businesses, particularly women and minority-owned businesses that might be on streets like Sandy or Broadway that could be potentially impacted. So that's a group that we really want to at least Initially, our goal is to target folks in that community so we can find out more about what their perspectives would be and understand what the, the issues and challenges would be with that. So I think the answer to your question is yes, we're looking at both of those things. And broad, more broadly, we're looking at trying to reach out with that uh, grant work to renter populations and particularly low income renter populations, potentially in the Pearl, to understand how those um, communities are, are, are fitting in in areas that frankly, you know, tend to attract, uh, you know, more expensive housing. So how, do, how does that community work together and what are the pluses and minuses for folks that are living along the streetcar? The other group that we're looking to reach out to are potentially uh, workers in industrial districts to understand what the impacts and implications might be, particularly in that Northwest area. So that's another group that we're trying to target. Um, your other question was about, um, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank immediately. What was the second part of your question? So the first one was displacement risk analysis, right. and then the second one is around community involvement, oh. community engagement on the community, east side. Yes, on the east side. Sorry for um, drawing a blank there. Um, on the west side, we are doing that sounding board, so a smaller, more focused group. On the east side, our strategy is really to kind of have larger community workshops because the questions are at a higher level. You know, more uh, high planning level uh sense of whether or not you know one line or another line makes more sense to get to hollywood and what some of the uh, pros and cons and challenges and opportunities might be amongst those lines so right now we have three larger public either open house or workshop type events planned and we're reaching out uh, to those communities on the east side through neighborhood and business associations and trying to build a mailing list we'll also use our community-based outreach organizations to help try to you know, get more outreach into the community, but that's that's the level we're targeting right now. Uh, we're also going, as I said, this month to several different neighborhood and business associations. We'll probably continue to do that over the course of the project. Um, and if we need to do more in-depth outreach, we'll we'll have to assess that as we go forward. But that's what we have on the uh, uh, plan for right now. And I'll just jump in to add that we didn't say this earlier, but we should have said that Prosper Portland is a partner in this yes. project as well. And so for the community and equitable needs analysis portion of the project, Prosper Portland and Antivernos will be helping us craft that, looking at both displacement risk, but also, you know, if we do create a lot of value to private property owners by doing these investments and upzoning, then again, how do we capture that? And what are the sort of agreements look like where we can funnel some of that money um, back into various strategies to help reduce equity um, disparities across the city, um, both in those districts, but potentially elsewhere as well. I'll just add that, especially in Northwest Portland, one of the policy trade-off discussion choices here is is that industrial zoning that exists and um, land values are lower in industrially zoned areas. And so if we, if we do change that zoning, um, there's potential five-fold change in property value. And so the, the equitable development strategy is, is to some extent about how that plays out and who, how can we capture some of that benefit for things that the public sees as a good thing, um, either on the job side in terms of loss of industrial land supply or on the housing side in terms of affordable housing. Um, and, um, and I think that's, that's been one of the reasons why nationwide streetcar expansions have tended to gravitate towards industrial land because of that that change in value allows the capturing of, of some of that value. Ben? Question in regards to the east side loop um, alignments. Uh, so you have three alternative alignments there. And I'm wondering if you uh, <clears throat> consider if it would make any sense, and especially looking at this map in particular with the land uses that are there, to look at it as from uh, from a broader loop perspective. Uh, meaning, you know, you go broader Broadway or Whitler and then coming down all the way, looping down through Sandy. I'm not sure if it makes sense with considering this specific mode being a slower type of mm -hmm. mode, but just, just wondering if that, that's an option. You know, um, I'm going to defer to my colleagues at Peabody <laughs> on, on that uh, question. Yeah. 
Sure. Well, I don't think that we have specific operational plans at this stage in terms of where exactly once the streetcar would sort of once it would plug into the existing system, then where it would go. Um, even though we're talking about Montgomery Park to Hollywood, you know, these wouldn't be built at the same time. They would be different phases. Um, if we decided to pursue Northwest, we'd probably, that would be a phase. That would be a first phase. And then potentially, you know, Hollywood District would be down the road. So I don't think it's, it's, it's not that we're looking at one alignment that connects the two in the immediacy. So um, I think we can think about, yeah, where the streetcar would operate in terms of loops. I, I'm, I haven't heard anyone suggest uh, building two of the three east side as a loop yet. But you have to look at it. Until we now. think a lot more about that. We had <laughs> looked in some of the earlier studies, for example, in the Sandy alignment of actually sending that line south towards OMSI or South Waterfront mm -hmm. as a different alternative. And um, so yeah. we've looked at a couple different routing possibilities. And early on when Sandy was identified, um, there was interest in crossing the Burnside Bridge. That was deferred because the planning for the bridge upgrade or replacement was so far out into the future. We're getting a little closer to that reality now, so that, that could change too. Mm -hmm. Steph? Um, okay, I have... I have four questions and then a couple of comments, but three of them I think are quick, uh, if that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Kate, I think you mentioned this morning that this is your first time before the commission. It is. Yes. <laughs> Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, uh, one, could you go back to the, the, the racial equity, I think it was like the second slide-ish? Sorry, and thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, so um, these were the, the background materials and the questions. If I understand, if I remember correctly, PBOT's uh, racial equity goals and their equity analysis through the city uh, are uh, specific to uh, income and uh, and race by census tract. Correct? Is that is that um, identified here in the racial equity analysis? So we yeah we have a. An, an equity matrix that PBOT has, and it looks at um, race, income, and uh, language proficiency as well. Um, and so we do, in our existing conditions, we did all of our sort of demographic analysis about where this, uh, like the populations that these different alignments would serve. Uh, yes. So is there another part to that? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious, is, like, do, do you have, the, is that map available within the alignment? And is that oh. current, um, is that current or, yeah? Basically. Yes, we do have that. It's in our existing conditions report that we just published online. Um, we did all of that analysis. And um, generally, uh, of the northeast and northwest, the um, alignment or the, the, the portion of the city that has the highest um, scoring in the equity matrix is actually along 18th and 19th um, compared to, and, and it's and it's slightly um, slightly higher equity populations than the city as a whole. Whereas kind of the rest of where we're looking at um, for these streetcar lines are about citywide averages or below citywide averages in terms of having households of people of color and low income. I would add that in the along these alignments, there's more people in the area daytime population from jobs than there is residential. So we also looked at jobs data. Um, mm -hmm. So in terms of equity, sometimes we focus so much on the residential, but in the central city, it's important to look at both. Okay. Um, also, you know, whenever I, I think of study, particularly transportation studies, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a, it's a prologue to investment. And um, I'm curious the, what is the landscape as you're seeing um, for federal you know, funding at the federal level, which has historically leveraged a lot of a lot of particular rail-based investments. Um, how do you see that, and where do you see um, the potential pickup uh, of um, of transportation, the transportation funding burden for the city? Yeah, so it's it's kind of an open question about if we if we were to move forward with this, whether or not we would federalize the project. Um, you know, currently FTA is um, supplying about fifty percent, and the city has to come up with a fifty percent match. And so we've done a mix in the past with streetcar. Sometimes we've done it all ourselves as a city and region. Other times we have federalized. Um, I. We are trying to craft this study in a way that we lay the foundation to apply for 
federal money in small sorts if we decide to go that route, but it's not a foregone conclusion. And obviously, uh, TriMet will be a part of this project as well as a stakeholder, and we would need their support in applying for FTA grants funds down the road. And then finally, thank you for um, sure. weathering these. My comment, I guess, is, uh, and as we talk about a lot, uh, I'm, I live in East Portland. I'm from East Portland, and we have a we have just vast disparities in transportation investments, and um, especially when we're talking about, uh, you know, in another, um, I'm actually contracting with the city um, for uh, fixing our streets right now. Um, one of those pieces is, uh, and related is gravel grading in East Portland because we're not even, we don't have the funds to uh, to pave our roads on an appreciable timeline in um, uh, historically unincorporated uh, Multnomah County. And uh, and so I, I guess I, I do have larger questions um, when we are looking at streetcar, um, whether it is the highest use of even a portion of our GTR. Mm -hmm. uh, when we are looking at diversifying and, and growing parts of Portland that are underserved, particularly by bus, and um, and have a, a significant portion of a backlog of transportation maintenance. So I'll just that's that's my that's the chip on my shoulder that I on, just on that issue because I know that's a common reaction to streetcars. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that the scale of cost for streetcars is. is orders of magnitude different than large light rail investments. So in, in the case of like comparing this to Southwest Corridor where it's 3 billion um, streetcars on the order of, of 80 to 100 million um, with 50% federal and, and a large share of the local being local improvement district property owner paid. So um, the, the assumption in the comprehensive plan and the transportation system plan when we, um, when we allocated the the projects there's an order of magnitude more investment being made in east portland basic streets and bus improvements than there are in, than there is in streetcar that, that's the short answer is we are spending a lot more money on that than streetcar sure and um and uh, sorry mauricio i know that that you're issuing as to speak I, and and i think that there's something uh you know transit uh, rail and streetcar are only you know they're more tracks related than you know that that uh, I heard Rick Gustafson once refer to streetcar as, as a walk accelerator, and that was as close as it got in terms of a transportation vehicle. But uh, um, and that it is more more about development. But when you look at you know what streetcar has, uh, that I'll just leave it there. But. <clears throat> you weren't invited up. I will just push back a little bit on that. I, I appreciate those comments. Um, and I think I have felt that way too before I started working on this project. But um, when I look at the ridership on the streetcar, it really is quite impressive and does move um, a large number of people, even if slowly sometimes and stuck in traffic. But um, it does and it, and it moves a lot of people that live along the line. And so I think where we get that um, potential to create housing along the streetcar line and then give people an affordable mode, we do, you know, we are creating a development tool, but we also are funding a real a real transportation tool as well. Okay, I'm going to so, get a little more comment, and then Katie's got a question, and then I think I've got one myself. We'll try to get done in 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. just when I provide some feedback. Uh, it's a great question. We have we have that same question. So what we've done is we think it's a great opportunity. This could be a great equity move. Yes. In an Could area. you please introduce yourself? Oh, yeah, Sorry. Maurice Leclerc. I'm a supervising Thank planner you. at Peabody. Maurice? Sorry, folks on TV. Uh, so uh, this is a great question. I think it's a great opportunity. We're exploring it. Could be a great equity move for the city of Portland in Northwest Portland, which, you know, as, as you see, is not an easy place to, place to afford. Um, however, we set up the scope of work in a way that helps answer that question. At the end of whatever year plus, we'll, we'll understand whether there's a big land use move here, but also what will be the accompanying set of transportation and other infrastructure needed to support that and bring that to you, bring that to council, and then weigh in the, the pros and the cons, the cost, the infrastructure, the investment, a way that, with that council, you know, uh, with uh, citywide goals and, you know, for, is there money that could be spent elsewhere, you know. But for now, we set it up so that we can answer these questions and we can have uh, the uh, a, a diverse conversation in terms of alternatives and, and a broad um, perspective from people from all over the city and particularly in this corridor. So that's all. All right, thanks. Katie? Well, kind of um, 
jumping on the bandwagon a little bit at East Portland, I noticed that there's um, there's always there's always this little there's usually in any map of anything that the city is going to bring, there's a bunch of development and then there'll be a little thing out in East Portland. And that's the same way with the streetcar. There's a little line that theoretical line in East Portland. But I'm, you know, wondering why was that not picked? You obviously have uh, different priorities. And so it seems to me that that would be I mean, I can see, I can, I myself can think of lots of reasons why you wouldn't, but I also am hearing over and over that this is really about housing rather than um, transportation. And I mean, you just said not, but um, so I'm just wondering, um, since Gateway is just so underdeveloped, so underdeveloped, it seems like doing something bold like that might, might have occurred to you. So I um, just was wondering what um, kinds of thoughts you have on that. Yeah, we, we, we kind of, I think this got turned. We kind of glossed over the the screening process that went through during the be, before and during the comprehensive plan process that led us here. Um, the original uh, streetcar concept did include some ideas in East Portland um, that went through some subsequent evaluation and study. In particular, the ones that rose to the top were a gateway circulator of some kind. And then we also looked at the feasibility of Foster Road and um, 82nd Avenue and 122nd Avenue as, as potential investments and what those would look like. Um, the, as was discussed, it's, it's a little bit of a mix between, uh, what you want with streetcar is, is a, an investment that will create private investment in tandem and, and so we looked at property values and development um, economics along those different alignments in an earlier phase of work before we got to even this this project. Um, and the 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 difficulty with with making streetcar financially work in some of those areas is that it doesn't the, the property values are low enough still that it doesn't you don't have a large number of property owners willing to form an LID or or you don't have a situation where it would make financial sense for them to jump on that bandwagon, if I can say it that way. Um, so it's very hard to finance streetcar in that kind of environment, and it doesn't necessarily create any development because the economics of that development just aren't there from a property value point of view. Um, that's the main barrier, and I think the conclusion from that work was that it would be better for us to focus on but we, we in, ended up choosing to really focus on north-south bus improvements in the comprehensive plan for East Portland. That was the, the big push, um, and we've begun rolling those out. And that's that was sort of the result of that discussion we had during the transportation system plan and the comprehensive plan was to um, to push on that as our priority. Yeah, and, okay. that. and uh, yeah, we do appreciate those um, those changes. But I just, I, you know, I, whenever I see these things, I never see um, the East Portland option picked as, as kind of a leap of faith or, a, a, or okay, let's really, let's really make this region hum. You know, it's just, I just want to point it out. I have a question or one is it the, Eric, you did a one sentence economic summary of how this works, 50%. Um, local improvement district. Could, if if that could be come back to us in a just not right now, but just so we understand, because it would be helpful for me to understand how much of this is the citywide discretionary transportation money versus how much of it is local property owners footing the bill leveraged with federal funds. Um, That's not yet determined, but okay. the, we know that there's some combination of property owners through through some kind of LAD tool or something like it and federal. Kate mentioned we haven't decided whether to federalize the project, but um, there inevitably will be some city money in it in some way. Um, it's not, I think, currently seen as among the top two sources, but it could be that that's a future discussion. Okay. I've got a question that's maybe more process related is, so we're seeing these two west side and east side come to us at the same time. They're obviously in different stages of development. Um, so I'm interested in understanding at what point what do you want us to recommend on? Clearly, map changes comes to us. Does alignment also come to us? If that's the case, one's already set, the other one's still in flux. They seem kind of linked. Um, and I heard one person, I think it was 
Ferry Manning ask um, that there wouldn't be a land use strategy on the east side. And I sort of question that. It seems like with some of the routes on the east side, the southern routes along Sandy, for example, there's already high capacity for more. There's a lot of development capacity in that current zoning. The route along Broadway, there's not very much. I mean, if that it's not that there wouldn't be a land use strategy. It's that okay. we wouldn't necessarily pull the trigger on zoning changes yet. Um, m- okay. The more, it's more conceptual. We might come back to you with a, a, a package of recommend recommendations for the future or something like that. Or identi- if if a, if a line emerged, the Broadway line, for instance, there might be some uh, uh, recommendations in a report that suggest that the zoning goes from CM two to something different, or lot depths change. I could imagine that. But not- when we see it again, would there be a few different choices, or would there be just one choice? I'm just trying to figure out how that parts how how the relationship between our commission and other decision making parts of the city yeah. go in terms of route alignment. The, the um, typically, um, I mean, just to give you a, an example from, the, albeit a bigger project, but Southwest Corridor and summarizing how your role has played out, is the, the commission has a role in identifying projects on the transportation system plan. That already happened. Um, there are streetcar projects on the TSP. Um, then we go into, and obviously you have a role in the land use changes, so we would bring the the whole package to you and and you would have to recommend those. Um, you don't have a formal role in the sort of choosing the final alignment, but the way it tends to work out is that you have, you're in the orbit of the different commissions and city decision makers that, that inevitably have to make some decisions. And so, you know, on Southwest Corridor, we've briefed you periodically as the alignment and plans have updated. And I think you're, we have something on your future agenda to update you on the, the um, conceptual design report coming up this spring. So there would be check-ins as alignments solidify and projects solidify. Um, does that? Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Got a... All right, I'm gonna hand the gavel back to Kat. The number of questions. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I was just, well, I was just debating whether to give everybody their own a little break because we're a little ahead of time. I'm getting some head nods. <laughs> so we'll just do a break until 2 30, and um, then I'll come back together for Doza, which is a work session. That's just a few minutes, guys.
Trying to sneak in. That was a quick couple of minutes, I know. Six. Okay. So the next item on our agenda is our design overlay zone amendments uh, work session. Um, I do have a disclosure from the for the entire commission. I'll read the statement. While it's not clear whether the proposed changes create a potential conflict of interest for PSC members because the changes affect such a broad class of property owners, in the interest of transparency, we have the following declarations. Commissioner Smith owns property that owns properties, plural, that have a design overlay zone. Commissioner Schultz, Spivak, Bortolazzo, and Lawrence Spence work for architectural firms who design projects or work for companies who design and build projects in the design overlay zone throughout the city. Okay, so with that, welcome back. Hi. Hi, Laura. And right. group. We're ready? Yeah. Um, so my name is Laura Lillard with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, and I am joined by my colleague, Phil Namini, also with BPS, as well as Shem Harding, um, who works at DECA Architecture, um, who was our consultant for much of the design um, standards and guidelines in the, uh, at the beginning of the project. So this is the fourth work session uh, for the Design Overlay Zone Amendments Project, and it's a continuation of your discussion on the design standards proposed in Volume 2. Um, as you may recall, DOZA is proposing two sets of tools, um, the design guidelines, which Design Commission is hammering out in their own set of work sessions, and the other, other set of tools are the clear and objective design standards, which will live in the zoning code, and they are under the purview of the PSC. Um, so the goal is that each of these sets of tools are following a similar blueprint, and you may have seen this diagram before. Um, and it, the tools are being guided by the three tenets laid out in the purpose statement for design overlay. And those are building on context, contributing to the public realm, and promoting quality and resilience. Uh, last time that we met, um, you may recall, we discussed the design standards related to quality and resilience. So we're going to pick that up with uh, design standards that relate to the public realm tenant. And these standards are listed um, in the table that was handed out to you. Um, we have an active standards working group that several, several of you um, serve on, um, are a part of, as well as one design commissioner. Uh, we decided at the last work session um, on the quality and resilience design standards that we should allow that group, the standards working group, to give a first pass on the standards and work through them to bring forward the standards where they felt like a discussion was needed. So um, we're going to try that out today. Um, the standard work, standards working group met at the beginning of the new year um, and we've worked through each of the standards on this table um, and we have listed them under four um, different categories. So we kind of put them into four different buckets and that far right column um, on the table where it says category is where you'll see the four categories. Um, we decided that either um, no change was recommended um, or it might be listed as consent, in which case um, there were tweaks or changes that were agreed upon. Um, there are some items that say discuss, and those are the items that we want to talk about with you today. And there is a fourth category um, that the standards working group felt that we should punt the discussion to the three by three, which is a separate group um, that has been meeting throughout the DOZA process um, and it's made up of three members of the PSC and three members of the Design Commission. And we felt that some of the um, standards, I think there are a couple of them that fell into this category, really just needed a more robust discussion with um, more members of the Design Commission to make sure that, um, that we weren't going in two different directions. So that's why you'll see that. Um, so we decided last time to jump to the items for discussion, and again, those are listed as discuss. Those actually are all on page three, and they are lightly shaded. So I'll give you a moment to turn to that. So Laura, page. can I jump in? Just, um, I, I guess I would say to my fellow commissioners, again, the goal is to just discuss these items that have been highlighted. 
to not at all discuss the other ones for today, right? That's right. Um, and we would go over these first, and then we can check in to see if anyone wants to pull anything off of the consent list. Um, and then we can talk about those at the end, if that makes sense. Yep. That's, I that guess, work? what I was exactly going to say. And if, if it's just too much to multitask, reading through what's on consent, focus on our discussion, um, it's not the last possible no. chance, but I guess my request would be to make sure if you're going to pull something from consent and it's not going to happen at, at today's meeting, that we send an email or get an email sent to Laura so that we can identify it for the next meeting. Sound fair? And hopefully we can get through this a little quicker today. Okay, perfect. All right, so um, again, it's on page three of the table. And if you are following along um, in volume two, which Phil can also toggle between the two, that is on page 53. Um, so the first standard that um, we have as a discussion item is actually PR 18, which is a standard related to the location of utilities. And this standard aligns with design guideline seven, which is about minimizing um, the impact of utilities and services to the public realm. And so this is about placement of electric meters, gas meters, HVAC equipment, et cetera, um, and screening those from the street. And there's a number of um, different ways that you can do that and you need to meet one of those standards. So that's kind of a summary. And Phil is gonna talk about each of the amendments that um, are being brought forward today for discussion. Good afternoon, uh, Phil Namany with uh, BPS. And I do have three cop for those of you, if you did not bring a copy of volume two, uh, your work copy, I have an excerpt that has the um, the standards table. So, uh, because these just show the summary of what the, or the standard title, they don't actually show what the standard is. So, I do have some copies if anybody needs an extra copy. I'm going to hand those out. And PR 18 actually is, it, it shows new, and so it's actually new to the working group as well. Um, there is a uh, ongoing a conversation happening with the, uh, as part of the River Plan South Reach. Uh, and there was some discussion about how the McAdam plan district and their design guidelines and, and, and standards could interact with our uh, proposal for the design standards. And uh, one of the things that got discussed was the idea of integrating, uh, potentially proposing to integrate the McAdam design guidelines and also to have the actual citywide design guidelines apply to the areas in McAdam. And so from that, there was some suggestions to have additional references to things like uh, public trails and, and to the river setback. So the main difference with PR 18 from what the Standards Working Group uh, looked at on the second was the idea that uh, the screening requirements for utilities that are currently uh, uh, applicable to streets also apply to uh, the uh, Willamette Trail or other major rec trails. So that was the, the suggestion from that. And I put on the discussion item just because the standards working group had no opportunity to talk about it. So Phil, quick question. Did I hear you correctly in that there is a discussion that the McAdam design guidelines would be replaced by the design guidelines that we're discussing now? There is a possibility on that. The, um, the, right now, the community design standards, because we do have to offer that two-track system, the standards already apply, um, and these would provide some um, additional you know, acknowledgement of that through the standards, but there is also some conversation about potentially uh, rescinding the McAdam design guidelines and having the citywide design guidelines apply. When would we know more about that discussion? Those that will happen with the South uh, River Plan oh, South Reach. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. I bet they are. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is there any discussion on this proposed amendment? Questions? Discussion? Uh, just raise a hand if you're supportive of the amendment. Here you go. Okay. Unanimous. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, the second standard is related to PR 19, 
about pervious paving materials. Um, and this one is, um, again, on page 53, um, it calls for at least 50% of all new vehicle area must be surfaced with pervious pavement approved by the Bureau of Environmental Services um, as being in compliance with the stormwater management manual. And this one is an optional um, standard worth two points. So this one, the, the request was potentially to raise the number of points to three points. Um, but there was some, some question about whether in relationship to the overall, all the vehicle area paving and other vehicle area and, and parking setbacks, um, there was a question about maybe taking, looking at them holistically with this group and discussing them. So I don't know if folks want to go through basically PR 19, 20, and 21 and have us kind of describe the changes for all those and if you want to discuss them together or if you want to discuss each one in isolation. I think that's a great suggestion. Why don't you run through them all? But can you quickly fill, as I'm sitting here reading the discussion to remind myself what we discussed, um, can also just summarize a little bit more about what our discussion entailed on while you're going through but all of them? Uh, I think with the previous paving material, there was acknowledgement of the benefit of doing that, but there was also an acknowledgement that um, there's not a lot of benefit if somebody is just providing a, a driveway to two parking spaces on site and make one of the spaces pervious. Uh, that's a pretty easy way to get two points. So part of the discussion on that was potentially considering whether there should apply to certain number of spaces or to larger sites. Uh, there was also some um, questions about what the recently approved Better Housing by Design project had uh, required for uh, alternative paving. And so on the worksheet in, in parentheses there at the end, it, it does have a little um, blurb about what that project uh, approved. And uh, in that case, it, it actually was limiting overall vehicle area to, to 30 percent and then actually asphalt could only be fit basically half of that overall uh, paved area. So it didn't necessarily touch on previous paving directly. So that's, that's uh, PR 19. Now PR 20, which is a required uh, provision, and there's actually two items listed under that because one, one was something discussed with the, the working group and then the other was um, something that uh, came out of the river plan as well. And PR 20 is essentially a provision that uh, on larger sites, as we'll get to it. <laughs> so if, if a site is, is over 20,000 square feet, um, that there be a requirement that surface parking be set back 25 feet from street lot lines. And if it's structured parking, it'd be set back 10 feet from street lot lines. Uh, one of the things that came up during the working group was what happens in that setback. <clears throat> um, and uh, also, you know, depending on how many parking spaces are being provided, there was a question about uh, if there's other ways to kind of limit the impact on the public realm other than basically a setback. And that was something they wanted to, they wanted to be a, a discussion on. Um, the sense was if it's just, you know, um, small amounts of landscaping or utility buildings or things like that that are in that setback, whether that actually adds any benefit to it. Um, and one of the things that kind of came out of this, I think that was in the discussion, was the idea that, uh, yeah, perhaps there'd be a limitation on how much of the frontage has parking um, as opposed to having an increased setback. Uh, related to that one on PR 20 was the idea that came out of the river plan that if we do have a setback from the street that there also be consideration of having a similar setback from the a major wreck trail or from the river setback. We'd have to look at that a little bit more. The last parking one that was set for discussion was PR 21 and that was just a basic provision that gave sites a point if they don't provide any parking. And part of that is the relationship between this one and some of these other ones where we're giving points for doing certain things to parking. The, um, the idea behind this was that 
because if somebody isn't providing parking, they don't have access to providing par uh, uh, providing pervious paving for parking, or they don't have ac access to, you know, they're not required to do the uh, setback, but to have another option if they're not providing parking of, of gaining a point, because the idea is then they can use that site for other um, other improvements that are probably more beneficial to the public realm. Um, so there was some discussion with the standards working group between this being kind of a gimme point for a project that doesn't provide any parking versus the idea that it does provide a benefit uh, that balances some of these other points that we're giving for projects that are doing things with their parking, such as using previous paving. So I think the, 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 when we worked with the standards working group, they, we kind of reached this point where um, I think it was just a decision that maybe the idea of parking and how we regulate that through the design overlay maybe needed a little more discussion with the larger group. And that could help then decide whether we want to have you know, larger setbacks for it, whether we want to have um, provisions for pervious paving and for certain, you know, especially if it's a larger parking and if we want to reward people for not providing parking. Good summary. Thank you, Phil. So maybe let's go ahead and step back to 19. And keeping all that in mind and how these all kind of play together, have discussion on that if there's any comments or discussion. Chris. Why wasn't this simply required? Why wasn't the what required? Why wasn't um, PR 19 simply required? Uh, we had actually had some conversations with a staff from PES, and um, it's not it's not something that potentially can be uh, done citywide. There's certain parts of the West Hills and, and other areas where pervious paving and, and being able to have the water soak into the ground directly may not be a viable solution. So we instead provided it as a point option with the idea that, you know, in some areas of the city, it might be more feasible than others. Yep. I would just add to that. Um, in the previous draft or discussion draft, we did require, um, I think, 30 percent um, or maybe it was 40 because we were um, trying to aim a little bit higher than the BHD and then we incentivized a higher percentage. So we had it sort of split. We required a percentage and then we wanted to um, incentivize a little bit higher and our feedback from uh, the Bureau of Environmental Services was that that was the wrong move and so they asked us to um, just to do what we've done here which is um, give it an incentive only because it doesn't work in some areas and they saw that requiring it would be problematic um, and just so to understanding that it's it not points. feasible in some places is it more expensive than regular paving a lot can be more expensive which is I think it's not just the surface but underneath the pavers you have to have layers 12 inches of gravel or so, so it's more excavation and more fill. Thank you. Which is thus the discussion about maybe increasing the points. What we are also worried about, though, is um, would it actually potentially encourage somebody to just put in one parking space mm -hmm. yeah. to get three points, right? And so that's that was our conundrum, and that's why we're like, I think we just all need to discuss it <laughs> and kind of how they all work together because we would certainly hate to incentivize a parking space just for the point to get the right. just so to get the points. I, I like the idea of um, only allowing it for larger parking areas. Um, that makes some sense to me. Yeah. Just to add to that, we did have a member of uh, from PDS that does plan review, um, and one of the suggestions they made that seems reasonable for you folks to consider is the idea of perhaps having it being for uh, parking lots with 10 or more spaces. Uh, that is also a threshold we use for when a parking lot has to have interior parking lot landscaping. So it, uh, there's kind of precedence with that. I like the idea of the 10 or more spaces, and I would argue that the conundrum of whether this incentivizes parking or not can be offset by getting points for not having parking. So I understand it's not exactly like for likes, but there's incentives both ways. So if you do parking, you do it in a certain way. If you don't, then you still get, still get an incentive. Just trying to connect the two. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Okay, so I'm hearing a lot of people kind of supportive of the 10. So we'll do a, is there support for revising this to be only for sites with 10 or more stalls? 
since we support there, then I guess we'll get into a point discussion later. How about that? Okay. And just as a reminder, or for those who are watching on TV and wondering why I said that, so many of the points are kind of connected together and I think need to be looked at as a whole. So the thought process has been once we kind of figure out what we're looking at, then we'll go into a discussion about how the points are working so that we can figure out if you want to prioritize natural environments more than parking and things like that. Yes, Mike. And when, when will we do that? I mean, that's not part of today. At some point we need to look at yep. all of the examples. And an excellent question for Laura. Right? And Sandra. <laughs> is that right? That's right. Um, this is, we, this, once we finish um, this set, we'll only be two thirds done. And then we'll have to come, we'll need to come back in February for the context standards, um, which we haven't discussed yet with the standards working group. Um, then we want to be able to sort of um, recalibrate where we are, um, bring that to the three by three, I think is the mechanism um, where we sort of understand where, because the design guidelines at the same time, as I mentioned, are following their own parallel process. So those are getting reshuffled also. So we just kind of need to make sure that there aren't major gaps. Um, and we would, I think, bring that to the three by three. Um, but we haven't actually had a discussion on how the points, um, you know, maybe out of that group comes a recommendation that then comes back to you. This is our understanding of the points and this is how they've been prioritized. Um, so eventually it will come back to you, all of the points. I'm just, I'm sensing that there will be a smaller group that has that discussion first um, because it, it needs to align with the design guidelines. So my sense is that it would go to the, uh, the three by three first and then come to you. But, but I'm open to hearing um, what you all might recommend. So um, let's brainstorm options. I guess one thought going through my head is maybe it's three by three and the standards working group. Mm -hmm. Just, but let's just yeah, let's think kind of figure that. out what schedules look mm -hmm. like and how mm -hmm. all that works. And I guess part of my thought is because I think there is a certain alignment with the design guidelines, but then there might be. Um, priorities within this commission that are kind of True. a little bit different than that group True. too. And I, yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So. And that conversation keep working at probably it. won't happen until <laughs> March. I can't believe we're already talking about things in February and March. That's yeah. scaring me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, so moving on, I think to PR 20, which is the large site parking setback. Um, and there were two items. Um, to be discussed with this one. I mean, I can quickly chime in here. I, one of these was my questions. I think of just great. We're talking about doing a setback, but a setback for what purpose? And and if we're wanting more landscape, and I was kind of thinking like a setback between a large parking lot and a, I was forgetting this was along a, a transit street, just even a residential neighborhood. It seems like you'd want that landscape. But then I, we started talking about, no, this is along a transportation corridor or transit corridor. And so again, if you're just going to set back and have it be paving, I'm like, that doesn't really accomplish. It's not quite big enough to be a plaza. And so we were just kind of wrestling with what it means as much as we like the intent of it. Mm -hmm. Creating leftover space doesn't really seem to achieve goals. Agreed. And I think that the greater intent behind this was that there, it, there would be a building or a part, you know, an active use of some sort. I think that would align best with the design guidelines, but we don't, that's not how it's written. So um, it was probably worth the discussion um, with this group. So any, yes, go Mike. Yeah, well, the, the new one was specific to the river and the Willamette River Greenway correct? That's, That's right. what came out of the, the yeah. river thing. And there, in that case, um, and if you've walked the Greenway, I, I don't know whether you'd agree with me or not, but there's a quite a different experience walking the Greenway with, with the large parking lot right next to it, as opposed to a setback with, with vegetation that would support, I mean, it would complement the vegetation on the Greenway. So that's why that, that one was specific to that particular um, purpose. And perhaps that one's easy. I was, absolutely. I think that exactly gets at my initial thought on the other one. Um, to me, that's a no-brainer. A no 
brainer to support. And I would say, yeah, the only thing I'd add to it is then let's give it L1 or L2 landscaping standards. So again, you're not just getting a trail and paving and a parking spot setback. Yeah, but a good a, a good example, I don't know how many of you have walked by uh, Tesla on the west side of the Willamette Greenway, but for a while they were parking all their cars right up to the edge of the Greenway. And after a certain amount of communication we had with them, um, they planted that in the mean in the meanwhile with native vegetation, and it's it's a hugely different experience. I think it could be even uh, planted even more heavily, but it's it definitely improved that that experience for the public um, right away. Katie, Eli, and you're you're mentioning the river, but are you thinking of every major public trail? Because I, I would think you would want that same experience in any trail you wanted to take, especially as the city gets more dense. Yeah. It's like yeah. when you get on a trail, you're just not going to want to, you're wanting to get away. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And I think it does say major public trail here, so that would right. be covered. Eli? Um, I'm, I'm just wondering whether the developer would, I mean, to leave that 25 foot or 10 foot setback sort of um, dead zone. I mean, I'm feeling like, Probably for a developer, this is scarce square footage is always tight. Wouldn't the developer come up with something to do rather than follow zoning to leave some dead space? I, mean, I was just thinking, as someone's trying to use the best, you get the most, the most you can out of the square footage you got on a lot, I would think that a developer would be unlikely just to, oh, I got to set it back 25 feet, just do that and leave nothing in between. They'd probably try and just to make the number, the project pencil, put something. Well, I think we saw there. with some of our examples that. Um, I think DECA worked on too. There was cases where oftentimes you had a situation where surf, uh, structure parking wasn't feasible from a cost standpoint, but um, surface parking would be. And so what they would, you know, the idea is if you don't say what is in that setback, they'll quite possibly might put a building and actually then the surface parking's, you know, 70 feet back because it's behind the building. Uh, and so this provides an opportunity to, to do that or kind of an incentive to do that. And I think that's originally what we were thinking of um, the thing we weren't necessarily thinking of is if somebody just decided to have, okay, I'm doing, treating this 25 foot as a, as a setback dead zone. Um, and so then, then the question is, do we need to fill it? But I, th I think most of the, most of the examples we were thinking of was the idea that they would go ahead and just put the parking behind the building. Uh, and then it's less of an issue. I think with the, with the, the re major recreation trail, you still have a potential, situation where if a site did back up on a trail or on the, the, the river setback, then that is encouraging the parking to go back there if you don't have another landscape setback requirement. So, Ben, I see your hand up, but just real quick. So if we were to keep both standards and you happen to have a be on a transit corridor and a public trail, we've now just got two big setbacks on, like we might have to say it's one or the other, I guess is where I'm going. Otherwise, you've got I'm re 50 foot setbacks required based 25 on one side and 25 on another right one one way to um, come back to that is to find out where that is even a scenario um, I'm I don't know if you can think of any off the top of your head where that's a potential issue um, but we could bring that back um, if if we agreed that we needed a setback in either case um, because of the context. Um, and we could call it either or now, but then just come back to you. I feel like I need more information yeah, before. Fair. You don't have to answer right now. So or. just be something to research. So okay. Ben had his hand up. I struggle philosophically a little bit with this one. I mean, if the intent behind it is to create or to incentivize active uses, it seems like a kind of a convoluted way to get there. Um, and I'm also in the same camp as, as Eli. It feels like 25 feet, if that's going to end up being just a landscape setback, it's kind of an inefficient use of land, which is always scarce, no matter what the use is. So 25, quite frankly, it's kind of an in-between dimension that seems like it's, it's just going to penalize whatever you're going to end up doing within the site. So kind of leaning towards perhaps reducing that. So would you reduce it for, so let's maybe again, I'm trying to get one checked off here. Um, the one, the new one, which is where it's along the river or a major public trail. Um, I guess if we're talking about that, 
being the same, would you reduce that setback? And if, if that's your proposal, what would you suggest there? And or Mike, do you want to throw something in there? I could see I could see a possibility where whether where if it's a a river or a major trail, it's justified. Um, but for all other cases, maybe it's more like a fifteen. This came directly out of the, the specific situation we're talking about, the South Reach, the Willamette River Greenway. Mm -hmm. And do you know what their setback is? I know you, you were talking well, about the test a lot, and it's not ideal. We're going to be discussing that. Um, right now, it's um, 25 feet. Okay. That's the Greenway setback for the city at this point. And perhaps it just encourages people not to put parking along the greenway. That's if likely it's up to, to 25, increase yeah. dramatically. Okay. So what if you said greenway 25 and street 15? I'm not too worried about someone squandering the setback, but that would be sort of a balancing act. I'm just not sure that, so I then I set my surface parking lot 15 feet off the street. What did it get me? Right. At all. I mean, I'm, not, I'm almost questioning whether this guideline makes or this standard makes sense for a street. I think I get it for the Greenway. Mm -hmm. There's a couple. I mean, we've seen in other in certain plan districts where we just haven't allowed parking between a building and a street or between a building and a transit street. Um, well, perhaps. And so so that's whether it. that gets expanded. Um, there is already is in the base zone some provisions that limit the amount of uh, frontage that parking can be on, uh, I think, on transit streets. So I think it, you know, and whether this goes back to the three by three, maybe we have to do a little more research and say, what is, what are all the base zone provisions and maybe some plan district ideas and see if the, there's something that should get augmented here. Um, above that versus or is what's in the base zones and the plan districts enough and actually i'm reading this it doesn't say anything about transit streets directly does right. this it's right now. it's okay. along any street i think is what the plan was so um yes andrea can i was just going to suggest that um i think doing further work and having further consultation on the streets aspect of this would be helpful because we are in conversations with other bureaus including peabot about just the competing needs and demands um for our right of way and so um i think we should just make sure we're circling up with, with others before you make any um, decisions, we can be better informed for that conversation. So per perhaps what I was gonna suggest, could we go back to the Greenway situation and see if we all have support on that, because I think we do. Right. And then I think I'm hearing a suggestion of, if the goal is just active use, perhaps you guys go back and work on that on the other one. But so first show of hands, which is just PR 20 new one along the Greenway. Is there support for having that um, in there with a 25 foot setback? Yes. Can I ask for a clarification? Because we yes. were saying river setback or major public trail. And I think Katie was saying, what about other major public yes. trails? Do we want it to be any public major trail? So Sullivan's Gulch, if that ever major public actually trails. gets done. OK. Yeah. Sorry. That and was I my also wanted to add a bullet point about um, um, including landscaping standards within that setback. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then just to circle back on the one that we need to get back to on, um, I think the intent was, I just want to make sure that we're all agreed on the intent, was to um, limit the amount of surface parking along a major street. And that was the intent. So we can come back um, with a better way of getting at that. Okay. I like it. All right. So then the last item is the PR21, which is perhaps the shortest standard, um, the, uh, giving an optional point. In this case, it's one for um, including no parking on the site. Um, and there was discussion. Um, there was actually a discussion in the standards working group, if I recall, about incentivizing this with a greater number of points but then on the other end of the spectrum with a worry that we were um, just giving away points. So we thought this would be a good discussion for you. Any, yep, Chris. So I'm interested in how this balances against economic incentives. Developers have an economic incentive to not provide parking already. So for a small site, it seems like 
the economic incentive might be the most significant. As you get to larger and larger sites, there's going to be more pressure from various angles to provide parking. So maybe we only reward this for larger sites, and I have no idea what the right threshold would be, but I just want to throw out that concept. Yep. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I, I will also mention that in terms of balancing your opportunity to earn points with parking or buildings or no parking buildings, it's not just these three codes. Back in PR 10, you get one or two, point, two points for separation of dwelling unit entry from vehicle areas. So there are, there's not at least one other place in the code where you can only get points if you're providing parking. Okay. So I was trying to, um, so I mean, I even as a client boost it up to two points. And maybe I would suggest that um, with Chris's caveat that only applies for larger sites. Um, I'm kind of in favor of, I think it was a design commission perhaps to, to, to increase the number of points to two. Um, and I'm not sure if I'd really seen the distinction between small site, uh, sites and large sites. I could argue it the other way where the smaller the site, the higher the impact. Um, I guess ultimately we're trying to incentivize a certain behavior. Yes, there may be some situations where we're giving away a point where Maybe the developer wasn't going to do parking anyway, but overall, I think we're incentivizing the behavior that we want. So, um, I'd be inclined to live as it is and just just increase the points. Any other comments, discussion? Well, I thought we were going to like look at them all together, the points. So yeah, I'm I'm finding I don't have anything to say because I just feel like I don't know enough at this Fair. point. I'd like I agree. to see them all. I'm not, I can't comment on the number of points either, personally. Um, yeah. So, it, is there support for um, putting some type of threshold to be able to get this point, whatever the points end up being? Especially if there's more points. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it looks like okay. we have a majority there. Okay. Obviously, we need some staff work on what that threshold should be. Sure. We've been throwing out 20,000 square feet with other ones. I don't know if that would make sense, but well, it tends to be, it tends to be, you know, when you're dealing with a 5,000 square foot lot or a, I'd say a 10,000 square foot sort of quarter block, um, parking is often hard to kind of push in there and get a building. When you start getting to, to a site that's around 20,000 square feet, you can often kind of run a driveway in through one side and, and, and uh, provide park you know a, a driveway with double loaded parking so i mean it's something we can look at but i know we've we've used that kind of as a threshold in the past makes sense okay so that concludes the number of standards that we had for discussion um but i would open it up to um the commission to let us know if there are any other items that were on the consent list that you um, wish to discuss? This is really good television. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> music is needed. Uh, I'm not going to sing. <laughs> it's a shame. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> you people still perusing. Mm -hmm. What's that? Get on your mic. Sorry. I guess I'd put out there for process. I mean, if people are looking through without having gone before, it might be better to just let it be a flag for staff for next meeting. I wouldn't want to be trying to read this on the spot. I was part of the working group, so I had a little heads mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. I guess as a, as a follow-up question, um, because there are a couple sort of groups of 
subjects that were also held for the three by three discussion. And so there actually hasn't been an amendment made. Um, there's going to be probably some follow up discussion that's happening at that state. Uh, if there's anybody with the PSC that feels that maybe it was discussed with the, the standards working group or some of the tentative amendments being looked at for the ground floor height piece, which was PR1 and PR2, and also for the series of weather protection items, which were PR14 through PR17, if there's, if there's anything that we should consider as we're going forward and, and meeting again in March with the 3x3. Three three. Well, I think to be fair to other commissioners, we should, if we're going to throw that out there, we should talk about what we were struggling with <laughs> and why we were giving it to the to that group and I just put everything away so I'm pull maybe we can pull that up on the screen here for everybody and myself the standard the PR PR one and three did you, did you want the standard or did you want the um no I was thinking the standard okay um I mean I think you know, I'm trying to again remember our conversation but So the um, ground floor height standards were basically a requirement. Uh, there were two standards. One was a requirement. One was a, um, an optional to get additional points. Uh, and it was for new buildings. And it was a requirement that uh, there be a certain vertical clearance uh, for the ground floor between the floor and the ceiling. And the requirement was for commercial uh, ground floors and commercial use to have a, a minimum clearance of 12 feet. And for those in residential use, the height was 10 feet. Uh, the bonus was if you raised those numbers respectively to 15 feet to commercial and 12 feet for residential, you'd get three points. Uh, some of the conversation that came up was um, this is expensive. Um, it can also possibly impact your overall height if you're doing, if you're pushing the maximum height limit on a building. It uh, can be, uh, if you're only doing a one or two story building, it can disproportionately affect the cost of the building uh, because of that higher ground floor. Um, one thing we did not um, distinguish in the standard, which got brought up with the standards working group, is whether there should be one set of standards for corridors and or transit streets and possibly maybe a, a not having a standard or a lower standard on the side streets. Uh, another possibility that was being looked at was the idea that um, maybe not the entire ground floor has to have that minimum height, but maybe a certain percentage uh, can be below that height or you know, minimum percentage has to be above that height. So those were kind of things that got discussed. And I think it needed, we just, we, I think we went around in circles a little bit. So the idea was we probably should have that be yeah. part three by three. Yes, we did go around in circles. Didn't you raise the issue of losing a, potentially losing a one floor? Right, so I was, I just wanted to make sure that we check actual construction types and right. depending on certain corridors it may or may not actually mean you the potential loss of a floor if you haven't calculated it right i think design commission wanted maybe a little more height than certain areas so we wanted to be in alignment with them so that's thus why we were pushing it kind of to that three by three to hopefully come to some agreement make sure we'd been thoughtful about understanding that section and when i say section the section of how tall the building is and and how that relates to the um, maximum height for code purposes. I think this is about when you turned to me and asked if I actually had a clue of what we were talking about. <laughs> which I didn't say quite that crass, I don't think. <laughs> well, it's true, which is why I really do favor the three by three coming back with recommendations mm -hmm. from people, even though I'm on it. I know there are enough people who actually know what they're talking about who could give us good direction rather than us mm -hmm. going in circles, which we would. Yeah, it was a lot of in the weeds about floor assemblies and a concrete structure having this much and wood assemblies and cornices and architects having fun. Too much fun, maybe. So if I might say, I really appreciate the idea that there is this three by three committee and, um, and I really like hearing what you guys come up with for sure. So I'm just agreeing with you, Mike. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Yes, Steph. 
Um, I have a question since we have a few moments. Uh, perhaps you can relieve me of my ignorance uh, related to um, PR4, affordable ground floor commercial space. I took uh, Jeff's comment um, a couple of sessions ago about, you know, what is enduring, like what is what is a, f a physical um, decision uh, and and what is more programmed. And I'm curious, is this is affordability? Is that an enduring mm -hmm. Um, like for the life of the building? Is that for a few years? I, I'm not familiar with this program, so. This, um, the, the program the of, of the PDC PDCs? program? Yeah. Right, you I, well, I know it's PDC program. I think Eli mentioned the time frame, which was pretty significant. I don't have it off the top of my head. It's, it's not significant. It's 10 years. Oh, it's only 10 so years. I was outvoted okay. on this. On the okay. So I, I suggested that we remove this from the criteria, mm -hmm. but I think the, the group generally thought it would be out of my own um, predisposition towards not providing points for things you can't see and programming could change over time. This just lasts 10 years. I wasn't, in, in some ways, it's, uh, I ended up coming down in the three, in, not three by three, in the standards group being okay with things that you're trying to incentivize stuff, wide realm of public stuff, whether or not you can see it. Um, I was, I ended up coming down that that's okay, even if I don't really think we should be baking that into our design standards. Um, where things are required, that's where I got a little bit stiffer. And so I, I was not interested in having things, um, achieving things through the design um, standards that might otherwise be achieved in the base zone or other, other mechanism we have um, that comes through us from time to time. So this is when a case where I was, I was outvoted. Okay, Chris. So we had a, PSC working group that worked with Prosper on this program, and I was I'm the last surviving member of the commission from that group. Um, it was very challenging to create a program, and we do have we have a zoning bonus linked to it. I don't remember at this point exactly what that is. Um, so I would suggest one: you know, if we do it, there's going to be a low take-up rate, and two, um, if we're really considering it, we should be consulting with Prosper to see what how the incentives align and make sure we really have something that amplifies rather than just creates another kind of branch that may not go anywhere. I Well, in our discussions with PSC slash Prosper Portland, um, they were supportive of, of having this in here. They saw it as an opportunity to possibly further promote their program, okay. try to get it to ramp up. Um, that said, I also was interested in if somebody just wanted to do this and meet the requirements of Prosper Portland, but maybe weren't actively pursuing say the floor area bonus uh -huh. that they could still get the points for that so that was that was one of the things i was also looking at okay. any other comments questions things you want to pull from the consent you don't have to do do you guys have any questions about the weather protection that was the other three by three discussion if not we'll just let's just talk about it three by let's three. just go <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Let's treat that one like the last one, and we'll come back with a recommendation. Oh, did I just close? Oh, that? No, give you the cliff like, notes. This is really odd. It, okay. Like okay. I was just gonna um, give a little summary of the next steps, so you know when we'll be back and what we're going to be talking about next. Um, while Phil pulls this up, I think the next time you will see us, we're actually going to switch gears and not talk about standards. We're going to give a little bit more time to the standards working group to finish up the work. Um, related to context. Here we go. Um, so that happens this week, actually. And then we um, will be sort of recalibrating those points, um, as I had mentioned. Um, the next time you'll see us is uh, the end of this month. And we're going to switch gears, like I said, and go into thresholds, um, process of design review, as well as costs. Um, I know there were some questions, I think, during the first or second work sessions about what is the cost of design review. So we're hoping to come back with some more information about that. That's the 28th. Um, we will return to talk about standards again um, February the 11th. And we'll do, I think this worked um, okay uh, to, to have a, a little bit more of a, um, of a pre-set um, list of issues to discuss, um, having been vetted by the standards working group. So we'll probably do the same type of exercise and just discuss the things that the standards working group um, wanted to bring to you. So we'll do that on the 11th. Um, and that wraps up the standards. 
And then on the 25th, we'll go over our list of amendments. So we've obviously been taking notes and marking all of the amendments. So we'll come back to you um, with that on the 25th of February. And we anticipate that the three by three meeting will happen on March the 7th to sort of recalibrate and um, align the standards and the guidelines. And that's our schedule. Thank you. Any other? Nope. Seeing that, we are adjourned for today. Thank you so oh, much. Oh, one no, other. we're not adjourned. I just um, <laughs> should have said this before you adjourned. Um, I just wanted to uh, remind you that we would be continuing until January 28th. Don't, I, don't we need to do that? Continue the, continue the work session until January the 28th. I'm looking to the expert on the rules. I thought we yeah. just had to deal with hearings and close those or didn't. But we have to continue work sessions as well. Continue work Sandra's. sessions. Yes. So we are continuing work sessions. Yes. Until now, we think January 28th. Until January 28th, yes. Okay. Pardon me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, well. March, so I see March 7th is a Saturday. It would it be the next week? Yeah, it's the week of. I, I probably didn't look at the calendar, but whatever that Please, Monday through Friday, we've got to come the, up with the date. I think date. it's the week of the ninth. Is that? Yeah. Well, we haven't date, come up yeah. with the date yet. TBD. That's why. So, yeah. It says work session in February, work session in February. So I'm c really confused now about what we just continued. I think if we're at the end of work sessions. Yeah, at the end of each one, you have to continue it. So to the next. When can't you get I to the just 28th, continue it yes. to until February. January? Right, until the next time, which is January the 28th. I can't just say we're going to continue having work sessions on I, this till March. It's probably <laughs> okay, gonna be fair enough. I'm hearing no. <laughs> fair enough. Okay. Got it. Thank okay, you. Thank you.